We're going to call the meeting to order and in accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting, this is, being meeting is being recorded, being recorded <laughs> by Zoom by the town and by Norcam and may be recorded by other local media. If we could all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we're going to call our first order of business, which is sign the town's regular annual election warrant. I think. Do we need a moment? No, he's going to go around. Are we good? Are we, are we all set? Constable is here. Mr. Ferriello, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Madam Chair, through you, you have a copy of the uh, election warrant for the May 3rd uh, annual town election, uh, which will be held at St. Teresa's Church Hall. Voting hours will be from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Mr. Gilberto, I don't mean to interrupt you. Can you mute? Can everybody hear Mr. Gilberto? No. Okay, because this is an important thing. We have a town election that we want voters to show up for. Anybody that's a voter in the town, the town election, May 4th, school committee, select board. That's the one, yes. Yeah. So we need people to show up to vote. We have a contested, contested school committee race, and we have our colleagues running again uncontested here. But Madam, please, uh, so show up for the town election. Madam Chair, through you, the town clerk, Ms. Lucas is here. I don't know if there's any further updates. Oh, my, I didn't prepare. see you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Come on up to the podium. Talk nice and loudly so everybody who's joining us remotely and everyone in the room can hear. Give us the details. When do polls open? When do polls close? Yes, so the election, as you soon do, my town clerk. Welcome. Thank you for having me again. Thank you. So as you stated, the town election is May 3rd. The polls are open at 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at St. Teresa's. So there's a deadline coming up. Um, yes, John Ferriel <coughs> is here to sign the warrant. And my <coughs> warrant has to be posted throughout the town, two places in each precinct. So um, after the warrant is signed, he will do his duty and post the warrant uh, by law. And then I just wanted to mention the uh, voter registration deadline is coming up for this election. It's April 13th. That's the deadline to change anything. Your address, your party. Um, you can, uh, the town clerk's office will be open until 8 o'clock at night. You can walk in and register to vote. You can register to vote on Secretary Galvin's website up until midnight. Um, you can also do a, a mail-in voter registration. And uh, I also wanted to announce that I have the absentee ballots. Um, you can vote absentee. You need an excuse to vote absentee. For this election, the May 3rd election, there will be no early in-person or uh, no early mail-in ballots. It's not allowed right now for municipal elections. Most likely, we will have early <coughs> voting for the fall elections in September and November, state elections. And um, I just want to let everybody know I have the specimen ballots um, that I posted on the town website. It has all the candidates. You can go on to the town clerk's website page and view the ballots in advance. Um, there is a contested race school committee and two of the select board members are up running for re-election. <laughs> Gonzalez and uh, Mr. Walder. And I think um, that was it. And this is a big thing of mine too, is um, don't wait until last minute to check your voter registration. You know, because if you go to the polls and some people go and they moved, you know, you need to make sure it's up to date. You can do this on Secretary Galvin's website as well. You can check your precinct, um, change your address, change your party, uh, those types of things. So um, please get out and vote. Perfect. Thank you. And Thank so you. if people can, people can, if you're not registered or you're unsure, you can go online. You can pick up the phone and call the town clerk to make sure. It's made very easy to be able to register to vote or make sure you're an active voter for the town. But please 
to check that well in advance. And, and if you aren't registered to vote, we have a lot of 17s turning 18s this year in school. For the students, even students, if you're not registered to vote, I think they're doing a voter drive. They, they were doing a voter drive. Hopefully you'll see a lot of new, new registered voters in the community. And, but that's not enough. Please come to the, come to the town election and vote. Have your, have your voice be heard at this election. Thank you. And I think um, tr the transcript is running for the contested school committee race. The Democratic Committee held a candidates forum last week, and the transcript is running an online forum as well. So it's a good way for you to check out who stands for what here and, and what their platforms are. That's, I think, April 14th, I think that's what that was. Oh, April 13th, thank you. Thank you. Anybody, any of the, uh, my colleagues have any questions? All right, where's that paper? Oh, yes, we have to vote to sign it. <laughs> Minor. Okay. Madam Chair, I move to sign the May 3rd, 2022 regular town election warrant. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for being you. here. Thanks for staying late, too. <laughs> All right, our next order of business is a public hearing on Ultra Cheek Events, LLC, Hillview Country Club, a, for a general on-premise, on all alcohol license. Sure, if you could come up to where the microphone is. I'm just going to read the notice of public hearing, and then I'm going to have you introduce yourselves by your name and address. Okay. You can sit. You can sit just down. Please have a seat. Sit down. Relax. In accordance with chapter 138 of the Massachusetts general laws an in-person and virtual public hearing will be held by the select board on Monday April 11 2022 in room 14 town hall 235 North Street North Reading Massachusetts in person and via virtual technology at 7:30 p.m. on the application of ultra chic events LLC for a general on-premises all alcohol license to be exercised at 149 North Street, North Reading, Massachusetts, in a two-story building consisting of a function room on the first floor, street level, with two rooms, one bar, two entrances and four exits, adjacent upper level patio area, and a ground level tavern consisting of one room, one bar, with two entrances and two exits, and adjacent lower level patio area. The hearing may be accessed virtually and in the publication, um, the Zoom uh, link is in incorporated, meeting ID, and the phone link is, is included. So we're going to open that public hearing. Please introduce yourselves um, by your names and addresses. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, my name is Adilson Santos. Um, this is my wife, Fabiana Santos. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, we live at 26 Nelson Avenue, Lane. Uh, we are the lieutenants at uh, the Hillview. Um, and we are applying for a legal license for the premise. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to you to just manage questions for, for them because I think I need, I think we need a copy of that before, before our constable leaves with it, right? Susan, will you get that? Okay. okay. Never mind. I'm not going to turn it over to you. Were you going to tap I was ready. All right. <laughs> I was like, what Sorry, you everybody. Do? I know I was going to get. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your experience and what you are intend to do at the pharmacy. So we've been in business um, as a commercial company for about eight years, but we've been on event planning business uh, over 10. My wife has been probably over 15 years. Um, we were primarily doing um, event planning and catering and the core for different events, uh, weddings, birthday parties, any, any type of celebration. Normally we used to take our stuff and, you know, back up in the truck and bring it to a different location, whatever the clients took us. Um, but now we have the opportunity that uh, Hillview happened to be uh, vacant and we, um, we were able to apply and we were able to uh, get a you know, move to town and <coughs> now with the new tenants there. But we need a, a liquor license to be able to operate. Okay. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues before we have public comment. Do any of my colleagues have any questions?
questions? Mr. O'Leary. Uh, no questions, Madam Chair, just comments. Uh, again, we appreciate them coming forward and uh, successfully making it through the uh, subcommittee process at the Hillview Commission. Uh, as you're well aware, the colleague, my colleagues are well aware, uh, there, were, uh, there was some interest in it. Uh, again, interest had been waning in relation to uh, the Hillview itself because of COVID and the inability to uh, run functions while things are loosening up a bit. Um, there were solicitations uh, from all sorts of types of individuals. Uh, the subcommittee of the Hillview Commission uh, had interviewed several uh, and uh, landed on these five people here as far as the best fit for the facility and for the community as a whole in relation to the financial aspects as to what the package is going to be involved and also uh, their commitment to meet the needs of golf course and uh, outings, uh, which is of primary concern to the, to the commission. Um, you know, as far as uh, opening the pub, I know there's going to be questions about that. That's for down the road, and again, that'll be in concert with the commission. Uh, they'll be consulting with the commission before any steps are taken to do that. As my colleagues are well aware, and the public is well aware, we had two very experienced uh, individuals and vendors there uh, for the last six years um, who both who were in the um, restaurant business, both requested of the commission to close that facility. Uh, because it just wasn't uh, economically feasible. Uh, we're hopeful that in the future, uh, with these people, that uh, something will be able to come to fruition there. Uh, they seem to be extremely enthusiastic, but they're going to take a measured approach in, uh, instead of just diving in, uh, <laughs> taking a measured approach in, in, in use, utilizing the facility and expanding it, uh, its uses as time goes on. They're looking at a five-year lease with a five-year uh, extension uh, upon it. So uh, we hope that this uh, relationship is going to be uh, fruitful and long and, and prosperous for, for everybody. And again, as the way that the, uh, the deal is designed is uh, they're going to pay us a, fat, a flat rate and then after a year of operation, they'll be giving us a percentage of the uh, gross sales. So we just want them to succeed. You know? Okay. Well, we heard a lot more about this application from Mr. O'Leary. So is there anything you wanted to tell the, the board and the public about your plans and your timeline? Because this is an application for alcohol license for both the, the function room and the pub. So if there's anything you can add to the dialogue of what you're applying for, I think that would be helpful for us to hear what is your plan and, and when and what your timeline is. Well, we, we plan as soon as we get the, the liquor license to start events upstairs. Um, we already started booking as of July, August on for um, weddings and um, birthday parties, showers, and golfing events. We have a few golfing events already looking into um, coming with us and coming back to the Hillview. A lot of people left because of the Hillview was closed and we are very excited to, to have everyone come back and have these events with us. And not only that, we also want to open up for you know, all of the, uh, the city events or any kind of events that, you know, used to be held at the Hillview. Um, obviously, later on, our plan is to, once we have that going on, maybe next year, looking into the plan of downstairs. Okay, the so, the, so the tavern isn't going to be open to the public? Um, not as of right now, because, you know, we are focusing on upstairs and focusing on making sure that everybody knows that you know Hillview was back open because we only took it now which is you know we took it at the end of March so basically it's not enough time to book events uh, enough events this year to get downstairs up and going but we are planning on ultimate going. goal is to get both of them going but just because we're getting it right now we want to get upstairs going and then we'll also focus downstairs upon the one contract with the, with the commission. But the ultimate goal is basically to bring Hillview back and make it the ultimate location for for people that want to come and hold their wedding. Um, we are we are hugely focused on the event planning and the decor. So we have huge, huge plans for the location in terms of bringing all sorts of events there, including not only wedding, but also the town events, the you know, local high school, the, the golfing events that used to be held there. We want to bring all that stuff back. And I know a lot of people have great memories at that location. We want to be able to bring that all back. And we've already had 
I've heard feedback from a lot of people that have been walking in just checking the place. It's like we have such a great time. We have great memories here. Uh, breakfast. We have, uh, you guys just have breakfast. Yes. So. We even have uh, a sweet 15 that has booked with us, and she can find out that, that we, we were able to get the location. We were going to be doing tennis there, and it was the last place that, for example, she had a, a party with her dad that passed away, which has great memories. And we've heard uh, from a lot of different people that have great attachment to the place and has great memories there. Yeah. We really want to bring it back and, and bring the community back over there as well. Nice. Okay, let's go back for some more questions, or just do my colleagues have questions, Mr. Walner? No, I appreciate you asking like what the plan is because that's the most important thing. We want to yeah. see you be successful. We want to see the hill view be successful. I, I know you don't have a lot of experience in that particular part. Um, I hope that you require that, and you know, I hope that you reach out to people that it's not going as well as you hope. Absolutely. Uh, because Absolutely. don't be in silent. Don't no. be silent. <laughs> ask for help. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Including me. You can always ask me. Not that I can thank help you. much, but I do anything I could to see you be successful. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wallen, any other questions? No. Thank you. Mr. Studo. Mrs. Gonzalez. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. So excited for you and for everybody. And um, it'll be great to see Junior Prom there again. Yes. yes. You know, Absolutely. which was always there. Um, and just to see that up and going and, you know, congratulations to the commission, to you guys, to, to the town, really, because this is yeah. really a gem that we want to see shine again. So Absolutely. We wish you all the best. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a couple of questions if my colleagues are all set mm -hmm. with questions. Okay. What is your experience with alcohol sales? So we personally don't have an experience with alcohol sales. Um, but we are hiring managers that are experienced with alcohol sales. We have a bar manager that is coming to with us. Um, we have experience in food sales. We have experience in event sales. We have experience with crowds. We have experience with everything else, but we've never held an alcohol license. Who's your proposed manager in your application? So we have a few that came, came to the hall to uh, talk to us, and we are going to nail, uh, nail down one, and we'll give it to the building commissioners. As of right now on the application, it's myself that's the as manager. So you are the proposed manager. manager. And, and are you tips trained? Yes. You're we both tips trained? We both okay. yes. And how many employees do you expect to work there for you? As of right now, we have nine that works with us for the past 10 years. Okay. So you're just bringing everyone, instead of you're doing it remotely now, you're bringing it right to the facility. To the facility. Okay. We do a lot of events for the Seaport, Marriott, the Hilton. Uh, we get hired out, uh, you know, usually uh, they'll contract us or a bride will come to us and say, okay, I, leave, I want my event done at the Seaport, let's say. And we come in and we see the space and we basically I do all the flowers and we turn the place around and we do also the event planning. And um, if it's at a place that doesn't have food, we have our caterer that comes in and brings the food and we have the, our workers that are trained to serve. And now we obviously will be running the alcohol part too. Are you running the kitchen there though now because it has the kitchen? So we'll you'll be, be doing the food catering. there? So as of right now, we will be continuing on with our caterer company that we've been using but then we will eventually transition to using the kitchen eventually. But primarily we want to be using catering service when we start open the door. And then eventually we want it, like I said, our plan is to bring it to its full potential in terms of that premier location where we will get to the sit down dinner as a traditional wedding is. But primarily we want to open the doors, offering catering service, using our catering we've been using for many, many years. And um, then we'll transition to doing sit down dinner using the kitchen on booking our premises as well, which will be run by a professional manager. And the timeline for that is probably around September because we do have weddings that are sit down that are booked as of now that would need the you know yeah. chef in in house. It's just because you know we were told that this whole process takes a couple of months, so we are being cautious as to book things and not be able to host an event. So that's why we don't have a specific timeline for you as of today, but September, absolutely, we need to be cooking, having a full event, because we do have events both in September um, that are sit-down dinners. 
Okay. So before then, you would be using your cater with your caterer's license to serve alcohol? Not alcohol. Oh, okay. food. food. Just food. Okay. Food. No, uh, for the license, it, we are applying for ourselves to have the license upstairs and downstairs in order to host our events. Okay. All right. All right. So, Mr. Gilberto, is there anything else that you want to make note of? Everything else is in order in the application and ready to go? There were uh, two things that we noted that are minor. One is in order to make sure we got all of the abutters correctly identified, we had to use the assessor's identifying ad address, which was different than the address that they use for public identification. So you'll see that the application is for 149 North Street, but the uh, assessors for notification purposes had to use 165 North Street as the address. It's just the way that it's recorded. So we did notify all the abutters from yeah. around the property. It was an extensive list, as I think you all saw. <laughs> the second thing that I'll, I'll just add is that uh, there was just a, an issue where I, I think when they issued uh, Fabiana's TIPS license, they had the wrong address on there. It's 124 North yeah, Street. It's just, yeah. I think they just want to get that correct. Yeah, so when I'll they notify, you have to renew. Reach out to them tomorrow. Yeah. They but, put 124 instead of 149. So, and that was all. But everything all is all in order, and um, I just, if there's no other question, then we have Mr. Stack here. I don't know if there's anything else. You, you good? I'm good. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm good. All right. The up real quick, <laughs> so we can move on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if there's no other questions, we're going to open the meeting up to anybody that wishes to speak in favor of this application. Is there anyone? Is that me? Sure, oh, yes, yeah, come on, come on I, up and I, I'm very, uh, please state your name, if your name George, for the record. George Stack. Uh, if anyone doesn't know you by now. Uh, but. I know, huh? <laughs> uh, actually, uh, this is a different approach that we've had, um, and as Mr. Gaberto knows, we, he and I sat in an office with uh, five potential restaurateurs who showed interest, but none of them are putting a bid. So, um, and it's, it's funny how they arrived on our doorstep, they had functions, from what I'm told, they had functions at the Hillview plan, but Mr. Eva left, and then somehow Fabiana was at a party, I heard, <laughs> and ran into Mr. Eva's wife, is that correct? Yes. Who told her they no longer had the Hillview, because she was looking to find out, well, how do I do my functions? And then she called Karen, who informed her that there's nobody, and they decided, well, maybe it could be us. Yeah. And it's the first, it's the first group that we've had come in that actually does marketing. And that's why I'm really excited that that pub, which I've been told for 35 years can never work. And it hasn't, it hasn't worked. Uh, Pat Lee closed it within a couple months of having the contract. And Nick Eva just shut it down without telling anybody. And I uh, walked in one day and the, the pub was closed. So these folks are aggressive. Um, their portfolio is, is really good. They can show you their, their um, what's this called, their, their phone stuff. They have it all on the phone, you know, you can see what they do. <laughs> they can show you the website. But they, do, but they do marketing, that's the big thing. And no one's ever done marketing at the Hillview. You know, we, we had, when, when Concord Street was in its heyday, yeah, you, 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 you couldn't get anybody to, to market over there. So it, it's, it's a great new beginning for us. They're going to be doing outdoor weddings. Um, they have a great relationship already with Chris the Pro. He's, he's designated the areas that can go up in the golf course while golfers are there so it doesn't impair it and have pictures taken. But it's, a, it's a new beginning for the town. Right. Yeah. And the best thing is, from my point of view, for 35 years with the Hillview, yeah. they're not restaurateurs. But they're willing to become restaurateurs. And they have a very viable um, caterer, if I'm not mistaken, has a Brazilian steakhouse in Medford? Yeah, they... Um, yeah, Brazilian, I don't know if you give free publicity. Because <laughs> I, they, and so it's a very organized group of people, and they're very organized, which is a treat for me. Good. All right. Very so we're going to note your Thank comments you. is in favor of this. Yes. And thank you for your thank work you. to us. I'm you. bringing this to the, yeah. to the fruition. You. All right. Is there anyone else? Yes. Mr. Gilbert, do you there, have someone that wants to speak? There is. There is a question in, in the chat uh, from a resident, um, Mr. Raguchi, who identified himself as a resident of 167 North Street. Yes. And the question was relative to 
uh, what the hours for the license will be. And so those hours are actually printed directly on the license, which Mr. Studo had, who are not on the application. I'm just going to read them. If I forgot to, to ask that, I'm, I'm sorry yeah. to, for Mr. Gucci. That's okay. That was one and of and my I, questions. I should have thought to bring it up. It's a great question. Yes. Uh, and my understanding from Ms. McNeil is that they're unchanged, um, that the license hours you're seeking are the same both for the hours and for the exact premises um, from what NY Ventures had pr previously. So I'll just read them from the license. Um, beverages may be sold from 8 a.m. to 1 a.m. weekdays except Sunday, which is noon to 1 a.m. Last call at 12.40 a.m. All glasses off tables 1 a.m. All patrons off premises 1.15 a.m. So I will note that that's what the license has indicated. However, the practice at the facility has been within those hours, so not up until those hours necessarily on either side. But my understanding, and I'm, I'm kind of looking to Mr. Stack over there to see if that's... Well, is that what it was applied for? So they that's would my have to designate, yes. Yes. They yes. designate them. Yes. That's what would have to be designated. So is that what you applied for was the same hours? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So so, so Mr. Rucucci just had a question. He wanted to know what they were. All so right. I'm reading. And again, historically... Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, excuse me. Historically, those hours have been significantly curtailed by the operators because they don't find a need to operate at 1 a.m. at 1 a.m. But uh, those are pretty much standard hours for all the uh, alcohol beverage licenses that we've issued here. And again, but the operator can curtail them. The board can curtail them too, but uh, we've only found the need to do that in certain instances where we've actually had to come in and modify the licenses when we had show cause hearings for other establishments that had problems in disturbing the neighbors. So we don't anticipate this being the problem. This is a standard application, and most people don't stay open longer than they have to. Right. We know that trying to go, go around and get something after our meeting. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, 1 a.m. might work. Yeah, go, yeah. yeah. If you stay open at 1 a.m., <laughs> Monday night, Monday night when we have meetings. Uh, okay, Mr. Gilberto, do you have, do you have something? I have one other comment. It was not a question, but addresses the issue. You, yes. You'll note the application was not for a common victualler license. So they are not, at this point in time, going to be qualified to be open to the public for walk-in service. Okay. So should they decide that they're ready to reopen the pub downstairs, they will need to come back and apply for that. So that's another thing that yes. will curtail the activity right. until at such time as they're ready to take that step. Right, and from what Mr. O'Leary explained and what you explained, that's, that's in steps that you'll have to be Correct. coming back with the through the commission to yes, be able sir. to do that. All right. Yeah. All right, we're going a little backwards. We're Sorry. in public comment, but Mr. Stack, what, what else well, do you want to add to the, that? The subcommittee, which worked really hard on Karen. You might have to talk just a little bit louder. Yeah. Cause really? Yes. Oh. Yeah. My wife won't believe this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the subcommittee, uh, which has been dealing with, with, with them for, since, what, October? November. November, October, along with Karen. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we weren't looking to have someone come in to fix, and we knew they didn't have any background in, in, in the restaurant business, but we knew they do have great success <coughs> in functions. So, they will, so we purposely put it into the contract that it's open for functions, and then at <coughs> a point in time where they either get a partner or somebody else who has background in running a restaurant downstairs, basically, they would come back to the commission, and then we would come back to you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. <coughs> any other, um, anybody else that wishes to speak in favor? In, if Mr. Gilbert, can you let me know if there's anyone, we're all set with that? No one there. No other chat on that either? Correct. Okay. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to this license? I see none here present. Is there anyone attending remotely, Mr. Gilberto? Seeing none. All right, we are going to close that portion of the public hearing, and we'll, if there's no other questions, we'll do Mr. Walner. Just one comment. Uh, when it comes to the alcohol, our town is very strict about making sure you don't serve minors, so I would encourage you, once you get to that point, Make sure you get a hold of the police, talk to them about how they do that. They really want to work with you. They don't want it to be a, uh, they're not trying to trick you. They really want to try to work with you. So I would encourage you to do that because <coughs> we, we, if you absolutely. come back in front of us, it's not a pretty sight. That's all no, I have to absolutely. say. No, yeah. absolutely. And um, just, to, just to say, because we've been, you know, even though we've never served alcohol, but when we work on an event, as event planners, 
and um, all our workers are in charge to watch the tables and make sure that no minor is is um, drinking. So, so this is something we've been typically doing for many years. Yeah. Okay. okay. Just just wanted you to be aware. You know, some most some events like let's say it's a sweet sixteen or sweet fifteen, we usually bracelet all of the adults and then we obviously walk around and make sure that you know no one is is <coughs> is drinking. Right. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Gonzalez. Sweet 15 is a thing now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh it's huge. <laughs> <laughs> Quintanera, that's massive. It's bigger than weddings. Market, yeah. Oh, it's huge. Huge. Yeah. They spend more money than weddings. That's <laughs> funny. <laughs> wow. Sweet yes. <laughs> Quintanera, that's what it is. All right, anybody hey, else? My kids questions? are much older. It's too late now. <laughs> I got away with that one. <laughs> All right, any other? <laughs> We're good. And, um, and insurance, Mr. Gilberto, a liability insurance, liquor liability insurance certificate is in place? So they have provided uh, the general liability insurance policy. I, don't, I know they were in the process of identifying their um, liquor liability. I'm not sure whether we actually have a copy of that yet or not. Yes, we do. You do, okay. Yeah, I, know that, I know that was in process. They had a temporary policy. They were going to a permanent policy. Yeah. And, and I can send you a copy of that'd that That'd be great, tomorrow. thank you. Uh, I'm not sure, can we delay forward one to you, yes, the liquor one? Yeah, but I'll, I'll make sure to get that out tomorrow. Right, thank 100%. you. 100% okay. we have it out. Yeah, and we that, have and that is, everything already, yeah. And that's also, as you know, a requirement of the license agreement with the town as well. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. With us as an additional named insurer. And it, it's, this is just step one, two, it has to be approved. When, once we it, once we vote, if it's an approval, the, the ABCC has to <coughs> approve it after us, too. Yeah. Perfect. I actually printed a hard copy of it. It's just that it's Thank not you. that clear to read. I did print a hard copy of the liquor uh, liability insurance okay, right here with me. Okay. You need to drop it on. Great. Thank you. But don't yes. pop champagne this evening. Okay? No, no, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If there's no other questions or comments, do we have a vote? Madam Chair, I move to approve the general and premise all alcohol license for Ultra Shake events, LLC, DBA, Ultra Shake events at Hillview Country Club. 149 North Street, subject to all regulatory department requirements, and to approve the bills and sound of the manager. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good luck. All right. Congratulations. We're looking forward to seeing what you can do there. Yes, thank you. Congratulations thank you. to you and to the commission. So, yes. best of luck. Yes. We look forward to your success. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you. Next order of business is approve the FY 2023 health insurance plan. Mr. Gilbo, do you want to talk about that for a couple of minutes or 30, 30 seconds? 30 seconds, Madam Chair. Yes, um, you know, so we've been going through the process of um, negotiating over health insurance for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, we have um, exhausted uh, those negotiations and uh, we do have a renewal proposal to set forth uh, for active uh, employees, uh, both for their premium and for the town share, uh, which would result in uh, the budgeted 7.5% uh, increase for uh, both uh, the employee and uh, the town share. Uh, and we have prepared a motion accordingly. Um, members of the Insurance Advisory Committee who might be watching this will uh, hear this information. Uh, at a meeting tomorrow evening. Uh, it is consistent with our discussions with them. So while I recognize we are about a day ahead of our conversations with them, um, the outcome I think is cons consistent with what we've been discussing. And, um, while it's not great news, it certainly is better news than we were forecasting just a few short weeks ago. And I believe you have a motion. And so you want us to, to vote on this even though it's a little bit ahead of the committee? Yeah, and, and I, I can, I think I say confidently that we're on the same page with the, the insurance advisory committee. Okay. Great. And I thank want to thank you. them for their help in the process this year Thank as well. you. Questions of my colleagues? All set? Do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve the employee health insurance for FY 2023 as indicated in the entire summer. Second. Okay, motion by Mr. O'Leary, uh, Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Our next order of business is a waste, a water and wastewater update. And I know we have a presentation we of do. this, which is brief. Uh, it's not it's not so brief to be candid because there's a, there is a lot to offer for updates but we will try to move quickly all right um, madam chair through you we have a powerpoint presentation 
that the DPW director, Mr. Parisi, who's just stepped forward, will review. We'll put it up on the big screen here and dim the lights in the okay. front of the room. Thank you. And um, we'll just make sure we can get that computer screen sharing as well for those on Zoom. Bill, members of the public can't see what we're looking at here. Uh, so is there a way for you to show what we're looking at? Well, this is what Good evening. Um, my Good name evening. is Joe Parisi. I'm the Director of Public Works, Town of North Reading. And uh, I do have a presentation on water and wastewater project updates. Although there are a number of slides, I'll try to go through them as quickly as possible and uh, we'll save questions for the end. Mr. Parisi, you're very soft spoken. So can you speak a little bit louder and into the microphone? That way we can all hear you in this room and anyone that's watching. I can. <laughs> Thank you. <Okay. coughs> Perfect, thank you. Okay. So the uh, water project appropriation and project updates. So the uh, water improvement appropriations for water main replacement projects, construction of chemical fee stations were approved at various town meetings, a total of 5,642,000. $5 An additional $3 million in mass work grants were also obtained for water improvement projects. So much of this work has been completed or is near completion, including the North Street water main replacement project, the Mount Vernon Street water main replacement project, and the chemical fee station construction project. Remaining water main replacement project currently underway include the uh, Shady Hill Drive water main and the Main Street water main replacement project from Burroughs Road to North Street, which you probably have been stuck in traffic already from. So moving on, um, so some of the details, the North Street and the Mount Vernon Street water main replacement projects, the projects are were substantially completed in the fall of 2021. The uh, North Street Temporary trench paving uh, will be removed and final trench paving will be installed this spring. So that's coming up shortly. The um, Mount Vernon Street project is basically going to be, um, the trench paving will, will stay in place as is until that is totally reconstructed. Again, that's starting this spring. So all of Mount Vernon Street from curb to curb will be repaved, resurfaced. The, um, Not in time for the parade. Probably not. So, we we soft soft sole shoes. <laughs> um, so the uh, the chemical feed station construction project 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 uh, there is nearing completion. So recently the um, generators were uh, installed, and we will be having some training uh, for all of the uh, operations of the uh, the booster stations. Shady Hill um, water main replacement that project is um, there's a request uh, to Conservation Commission to see if there is uh, any um, impacts, I guess, to the wetlands and we'll get a determination from them shortly. And the uh, plans are pretty much ready to go. They'll be going out to bid as soon as that's confirmed. The Main Street water main upgrade from Burroughs to North Street. So that is a replacement of a 10 inch water main with a new 12 inch water main. And we have uh, N. Greenison Sons as the low bid for that uh, project, and they were awarded the contract, and they started that work near the end of March. And um, that project will have temporary trench paving 
remaining in place until October where they will um, remove that and, and install a permanent trench asphalt uh, paving. Moving on. The uh, proposed municipal wastewater system appropriation and project update. An appropriation of uh, $2.893 million was approved by voters in the October 2021 town meeting using money from the town that the town received from the uh, sale of the former JT Berry property located at the end of Lowell Road. The town is contracted with Wright Pierce to provide preliminary design for the proposed municipal wastewater system and for final design of a portion of the system located within the Mass DOT project area of routes 125 and routes 114 intersection and where uh, Mass DOT is designing now for the drainage improvements and roadway resurfacing you know we are also looking to, to you know, have our designs ready to go there will be a five-year moratorium on road openings in that area so we want definitely to be uh, within their project uh, bids and um, also have our um, infrastructure installed at the ground, in the ground at the same time. The town is also contracted with Kleinfeld to perform a municipal wastewater financial assessment study on the options for financing the estimated project cost of the municipal wastewater system. So just a, a quick look at the map. This is the in-town work. You can see it's going down Main Street, Route 28, also North Street to Lowell Road, and um, section of Park and Concord. <coughs> down near the uh, Wilmington line. There's also out of town construction of two force mains. It'll be up 20, Route 28 for a little bit into Andover and then taking um, the Route 125 over to 114. And you can see where the green circle is. That's where the Mass DOT project area will be. And beyond that, moving to um, we will go into Lawrence for the uh, a connection to the uh, Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. Moving on. Here's a uh, anticipated project schedule. We have permitting, we have sewer financing planning, and update of uh, property value analysis. That's all happening now, as is some mass DOT design. And um, later on, we'll get into the bidding I think that's uh, in 2003, so quarter four, and also quarter one of 2024, uh, rather, 2023-24. And you can see preliminary design will happen. Um, it's currently happening, will continue to happen till uh, looks like the quarter of two of 2023, final design, and then bidding. Construction will take place 2004 to 2006. So the proposed municipal wastewater system design updates, there's the final environmental impact report update. That is a report that uh, we'll be uh, submitting after we um, look at uh, comments received from a uh, notice of project change that was um, advertised in the published in the um, environmental monitor on March 24th. And we're in a current 30 day comment period. Town response will be, uh, town will put responses in their final report. Mass DOT project area update. So the roadway borings and surveys um, will be occurring in Mass DOT roadways. We hope to um, have that work starting in May of 2022. We will be submitting shortly a 75% project design plans to Mass DOT for their review. The uh, GLSD and neighboring communities. So the town and the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District have met and will continue to have discussions relating to connection to the GLSD wastewater plant. The town is working with neighboring communities that the municipal wastewater system is proposed to pass through to gather information for design purposes. Sewer pump station locations. Probable areas for seven pump stations are being identified for preliminary design purposes. Pump station flow is being examined to help determine size of pumps and motors. So 
So the town staff and project engineers continue planning and management of the ongoing work. Project update meetings are routinely being held. Project design is ongoing for both the town, uh, in town and out of town locations. The town is working with neighboring municipalities of Andover, North Andover, and Lawrence in order to gather information about the utility locations within Master OT Highway and other uh, civil force mains are proposed to be located as well. Permitting for access on Master OT Highways for conducting roadway borings and utility surveys for design purposes is also in progress. It is anticipated that MassDOT will issue permits so that borings and survey work can begin in May. <coughs> All right, I'm going to take a quick water break. Yes. Mr. Parisi, before you start with the next one, do we do do my colleagues have any questions so far on what's been presented? I do. Can I ask you some just a few quick questions on what you just explained Certainly. to us? Um, the temporary paving. I think you were talking about the temporary paving. Can you explain that? It's just in place. Why why hasn't why haven't the roads been resurfaced? Is it on some sort of a schedule? Is it not completed? Is it underlying paving? Uh, I mean, underlying construction work not completed? Or sure, I can explain that. Yes. So after um, the initial uh, installation of the water mains are uh, have been completed, um, there is a period of time where the, the trench will still s settle. And, and it takes some time for that to happen, and we'd like to have that happen over a winter period as well. That's where the most, you know, settlement will occur. Okay. So now that we're out of winter, we are going to take out the, uh, what we call temporary um, trench repair and put in a permanent repair. Which means you're going to redo the street. We're going we're to redo the trench. So we're not, it's not going curb to curb okay. on North Street. Uh, but Mount Vernon, it so happens that the engineering department had already planned to reconstruct that after the installation of the water mains. Um, but that's not the case in uh, North Street. And in fact, it might be, as you'll see, you know, this project may have some impacts to North Street, at least that section from Main Street down to Lowell Road. Um, but certainly we recognize that North Street is in, in pretty bad shape and, you know, so some additional repairs may be necessary and we'll figure out it how that could be uh, funded and, and installed. Okay. The, my second question, you, you, had, you had up there a five-year road opening moratorium. I don't know. So, what, so, what so typically that? when, uh, well, certainly Mass DOT has a policy, and, and a lot of municipalities do as well. When a, pay, when a roadway is, uh, you know, freshly paved, the last thing you want is, you know, a utility company coming in to, you know, pull a permit to open up that asphalt, new asphalt roadway and put a you know, new water line connection in or something like that. So they prohibit any, any disturbance of those roadways for five years regardless of what the need is. Okay. And then uh, I wanted to understand what w the project design plans, I'm, it's just a line and a line and a line. So what's the, what is the complexity with that, if you could explain it. Is there stuff underneath it, that infrastructure that it has to go around, or what does that entail? Um, I'm just trying to figure out if I understand uh, your question exactly, if you could repeat that. Is project, the project design plans, to me, it, it would be where the route is. Is there something more to it than that? In other words, is it, is it phases of construction or is it, is it? So project design. Trying to figure out what's in the ground at where Yeah, so the, there, there, there are definitely different steps within the design process. You know, you, you, you start with preliminary design and you're gathering a lot of information at that stage of design. So you're going out to do some surveys of what the depths of um, you know, your uh, storm drains may be, uh -huh. catch basins, okay. uh, manholes, and also uh, water valve stops, things like that. Okay. So you're actually popping up you know, open covers and you're, you're sticking survey uh, instruments down to capture data. All right. Okay. So it's not just, here's the route. 
No, it's not just you know putting ink to, to paper. Okay. Yeah. So there's oh, a lot of data sense. gathering. Then there's you know looking at the numbers, trying trying to figure out um, once you have that data, best routes and things like that. All right. Okay. Very good. That's it. All right. We are all we're all good. Okay, so now I'll talk about the Admissible Wastewater System Financial Assessment Study. It's an assessment on financing options for the Admissible Wastewater System. So we have uh, two parts to this study. So it's a part one, Municipal Wastewater System Cost and Financing Analysis. So the scope of work in this part is uh, some GIS mapping of the proposed Municipal Wastewater Service Area, uh, performing a three-year water use analysis to assign sewer units, Confirm the accuracy of the 500,000 gallons per day annual sewer discharge. Provide a summary of betterment assessment methods. Develop a wastewater system project financing model, including the use of sewer betterments, debt exclusion, grants, and other special revenues. Assist with the draft sewer betterment assessment bylaw for town meeting adoption. And then a presentation of part one cost financing information to the select board in June of 2022. Part two is property valuation and new growth analysis. So perform a potential build-out analysis. This is, you know, with sewer uh, proposed to be installed at, on the routes shown. Conduct the public outreach and so, uh, solicit survey data from property owners and businesses. Develop a matrix of potential property development. Recommend zoning regulation changes, if any that may be needed, to optimize desired development. Evaluate potential real estate market value increases and in new growth tax dollars. Calculate a return of, on investment over a 30-year debt service payment period. Provide public outreach meeting assistance during outreach meetings with property owners, businesses, and with the general public and then presentation of part two information to the select board plan for the summer of 2022. All right. So public outreach efforts, little description here. So, um, so project information flyers are being developed for public outreach efforts to the entire community of North Reading, including property owners and business owners abutting the proposed municipal wastewater system. Information on proposed municipal wastewater system will be made available on the town's website for anyone to review. A survey questionnaire will be sent to a list of large property owners, businesses, as well as properties that we see have high redevelopment potential uh, that are along the proposed municipal, wa municipal wastewater system route and to help identify potential property use redevelopment of these properties if the sewers were to be installed. Follow-up <coughs> conversations with these select owners will also take place. And public meeting will be held to allow town residents and property owners and business owners about the proposed municipal wastewater system to attend and obtain updated information on the project and then to ask questions. So in summary, uh, October 2021 town meeting authorized continued planning and design for a $113 million wastewater sewer project on Main Street, Concord Street, North Street, west of Main Street, Lowell Road, west of North Street. Surveying, mooring, and other design related activities including interaction with property owners began in January and will continue in the coming weeks. The town's cost financing consultant, Kleinfelder, will be con con contacting property owners along the proposed route and will be engaging with residents townwide regarding this project. The Department of Public Works is in discussion with MassDOT, the towns and city along the route required to connect to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District plant in North Andover. Residents will have opportunity to learn more about the, this project at information sessions and meetings. This project will likely require a combination of potential funding sources, including betterments assessed to abutting property owners, connection fees, state and or federal grants, and or additional taxes, new tax revenue or debt exclusion override. Planning for the project has highlighted up updates that are recommended for the town's betterment bylaw, potentially recommending as soon as June town meeting. The select board anticipates bringing the entire 
final design and construction project in the project amount of 113 million to a special town meeting in late fall. And questions and answers. Great, thank you. Yeah, well. Let's have let's take some questions or comments or anything. Mr. O'Leary, you good? Mr. Walner. Just a quick question. The return on investment that, that particular study, when is that going to be available again? Uh, what is the financial piece of the there's a lot of pieces of that financial piece so yeah, yeah. right yes, there is yes there is so I'm just wondering it sounds like midsummer we're gonna know that well well, well certainly we will yeah and, and perhaps a little sooner than that okay all right yeah. that's sooner than I expected I figured we went up to town meeting actually um, no our goal is to have it sooner sorry. and get it out there yeah no that's good that's good enough yeah. all right thank you that was my first question mm -hmm. All set, Mr. Yes. Yes. Mr. Studo. Nothing. Okay. Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, I have a question, and just in terms of the funding pieces for this, and are we going to see any kind of a <coughs> plan on that? How? When are we going to see a plan on what funding derived from what sources? Because it's betterments, right? All of the all of the property owners along the road, I'm assuming, would be um, subject to a betterment for this. That's correct. And, and so uh, Kleinfeld is working on part one of that, um, the study, which will have data um, available to be viewed or, or presented to you all. Um, so I think we have that in June. Um, that was the June presentation to the select board. So we're going to see that kind of proposal on how we're going to pay for it that way. And there how do let's say there aren't existing businesses along these corridors when they do become when there are new businesses that would assume you know we can assume will be built there do they pay a betterment as they're built so there are there are typically two parts of a betterment one would be or, or assessments one would be um, bettering those that are currently um, you know in use um, also um, with that current type of use or water use in this particular case the, the assessment will be based on that so if another property comes in later with additional use or if it was vacant land and they build upon that there'll be what's called a uh, privilege fee or compensatory fee additional uh, fee will be charged for the additional capacity of wastewater that they're they're uh, taking up with the new development and do we have to have additional permitting? Are there additional permitting requirements where you add the 500,000 gallons per day? The, and the that's based on what is existing now? So we are, we are uh, purchasing capacity from the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District of 500,000 gallons per day. Um, there will be a need, immediate need for only you know, half of that or less. Um, and so the rest would be reserve capacity for a couple of things. One would be um, additional um, growth within the sewer area. So those that are currently already uh, connected and were originally assessed, if five years from now they, they develop additions or you know tear down a gas station, put up a restaurant, those will have additional compensatory assessments of um, that reserve sewer capacity. Okay, so we don't need to just keep going back for more and more permits. We do not. We're purchasing okay. enough to take care of that, and we're also t um, purchasing enough to expand into other parts of town where there may be more environmentally sensitive areas uh, where we will be able to resolve those as well in the future. Okay. All right. That's great. Mrs. Gonzalez has a question. Um, on candidate night, somebody actually asked me if there would be a requirement to hook up or if it would be optional if you are on the line? Um, that's typically a, a Board of Health decision whether they have uh, regulations or bylaws that require uh, connection. I've, my experience in the past is that there's been some uh, leeway in that and not require that uh, to, to take place. Um, if, especially if they just you know, did a uh, we we reconstructed their septic system or okay. something like that. It was but, somebody who had just done that. Right, so. but let me remind you: it doesn't mean that they they won't be getting a better assessment. They will for that street work. They just don't have to do the on-site work, which everybody would would have to do and pay 
uh, separately themselves for that work. And what, would they pay from the point of their establishment to the road? Is that how that works? That's correct. They would, they would typically be left a, uh, what's called a common sewer lateral to the property line. So the, the street work would all be done from the, the sewer main to the property line and that they would at some point connect their house to that sewer line. Do you have any more questions? No. I don't know if that was why your hand was raised, Mr. Gilbert. Yeah. It's something different. Okay. It was, it was answered. He answered it, yes. So if Okay, now I have a follow-up to that. I'm sorry, but this is, we have to get these, all these, the other question that was asked at that candidate site was, are they going to extend it to Martin's Pond? And I right. think that was a big, that, that, keeps, that keeps actually resurfacing. My understanding in all of these presentations has been that it will be built as though there's potential, but we're not doing that right now, and it, that would be, part of a phased in development that's years down the line, not immediately down the line. Can you speak to that at all? It's not even on the table right now, right? That's correct. It, it's, um, it's a area of town that would be another phase at some point in the future. We have capacity, as I said, uh, within that 500,000 gallons, I believe, to, um, to expand from where we are off of Main Street onto the side roads. Um, I'm not not necessarily the Martin's Pond, but you know any area off of that. Um, but certainly, you know, we have capacity for um, going down those side roads and, and dealing with some environmental issues that may be an issue in the future. Okay, so there's potential for grant funding. There's potential for, um, you know, kind of <coughs> piggybacking upon the work that's already being done, which is why we're trying to move this along more quickly. And, but you also, and there's betterments, we're gonna see a betterments bylaw, a proposed betterments bylaw. Correct. And we're also talking potentially uh, an override to be able to pay for part or some or portions of this. Right, above and beyond what the betterments and other special revenues and grants could pay for, there would be some portion of that um, through taxes. All right. Okay. Now we're going to go to Mrs. Hurlbut from the Finance Committee. Mrs. Hurlbut. Uh, Mr. Preece, my understanding is that while you might or might not save any money by going by Merrimack College uh, while DOT is doing work there, that the issue is more if you don't follow DOT, then you have to wait five years before you can do a sewer. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. All set. Any other questions? Thank you. We're looking forward to seeing more from you soon. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We've got our next order of well business. Well said, Mark. Wow. <laughs> I know. <laughs> he's, I think he's here for maybe a couple of things. So. All right. Moral, moral support. Uh, yes, and thank you too for um, all the work that you're yes. putting in on this, and to our, you know, our team here as Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Mr. Studo, and, and certainly Mark Clark is a huge, our huge uh, part of make, moving this forward and trying to get this, trying to bring this to fruition for the town. So we really appreciate your effort. So our next order of business. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. <laughs> I can't. I'm tethered to this thing. <laughs> Our next order of business is to review and approve potential changes to the solid waste program for FY 2023. Welcome. So here today um, is uh, some members of the recycling committee. Dean Greenberg. Uh, Dan Greenberg is uh, sitting at the table there, and I believe you have a, a word or two. Um, representing the committee. Uh, we have um, the current chairperson and two former chairpersons of the committee, just in case. <laughs> um, so, you, oh, I'm sorry. Do you, are you doing the presentation, Mr. Greenberg, or? Is I, I am doing the presentation, uh, but I, I just wanted um, Dan to uh, 
just, just sort of reflect on the letter that he, he uh, sent to uh, the town administrator. I believe you have in your package. Yes. <coughs> I'll be very brief. Um, based on the input that we received at our last hearing, um, the questions and the comments, uh, the recycling committee reviewed its proposal and uh, is deciding to uh, amend the proposal to uh, instead of require, uh, having a, a maximum of two 35 gallon barrels to go to 50 gallon barrels. Um, what we decided was that it's really not so much that you want to regulate the size of the barrels, you want to regulate what's going in the barrels. So we, in addition, we're asking that you consider a weight limit of 40 pounds per barrel. Um, and I think that would be the need to reduce the amount of trash that is presented to the trucks and will create the equity that we have talked about. So um, that's, that's the new proposal. Um, it begs, the weight limit begs a question that I will answer before somebody asks me. Um, and the answer is no, the trucks will not be equipped with scales and people will not be penalized because they go a few pounds over. Um, most of the people who work the trucks uh, know full well what things weigh and it is anticipated that the only enforcement proceeding which would go up until um, declining to accept the barrels um, would be for uh, serious violations or habitual violations. And the BOJ or M are going to use common sense in assessing whether or not to uh, go to a, a level of enforcement. And, and issues like that would be vetted through the DPDW office. Yeah. Certainly, we're in communication with them. So, so thank you, Dan. Um, so, if not, um, any questions? Please. I'll move yeah, forward. Sure. First, thing, thank you. Great, thank you. So, uh, so this is a. Um, Solid waste disposal program proposed modifications. You probably saw a few of these slides here. It won't all be repetitive, but I wanted to sort of keep some of that in here for this presentation as well. So page you throw for overflow trash disposal and other waste bin compliance amendments. So we are um, currently operating the program. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, program is available uh, to residential properties consisting of four dwelling units or less. An annual flat fee is paid by residents in order to participate in the program. Residents are limited to disposing their trash in up to the two 35-gallon trash barrels and have unlimited recycling capacity. They have been limited enforcement of the two-barrel limit. Overflow trash above the two 35-gallon trash barrel limits have been allowed to be disposed of if residents call, contact the DPW, and therefore we notify JRM to pick that up. One bulk item per week, such as mattresses, box springs, furniture, can be left at the curb to be picked up and put into the trash um, at regular pickup. CRTs, such as TVs and computer monitors, are collected curbside by JRM and at no additional cost to the residents. Residents schedule the pickup with, with uh, JRM, and JRM charges the town $15 per the CRT collected. White goods such as air conditioners, washing, washers and dryers also collected curbside at a $20 fee. So proposed changes to the current program. So residents will be allowed to dispose of their trash in up to two 50 gallon trash barrels containing no more than 40 pounds of solid waste per barrel. In fact, uh, curious, I, I found some information that Mark had uh, dug up for me in in uh, July 11, 2014, we sent out a notice to, to residents saying pretty much just that, that um, you know, they had 35 gallon barrels uh, as a limit, but you know, there was some leeway there. We understood that there were larger barrels, certainly 50 gallon barrels as well, but 40 pounds to be the, the maximum put in those barrels. So this goes back a ways coincidentally, I guess. You know. uh, we have um, a proposed page you throw for the overflow trash. So in other words, if you have more trash than can be contained in two 50 gallon trash barrels containing no more than 40 pounds each, you have an option now to, um, pay, to pay 
uh, for that trash in a page or throw bag and put out two, three, whatever you need if you had a clean out or a potty. Um, there's no limitations. So this is um, a, a common program. I'm, I'm not sure how many are familiar um, with this program in this room, but pay to throw uh, requires the purchase of town authorized bags. Um, in fact, I think I always carry one in my bag just in case for events like this. So this is a not printed with um, North Running, but this is a sample of what a page of throw bag would look like. All right. So you have floor capacity. You know, I live in Gloucester. I use these all the time in Gloucester. I do one bag a week. You know, there are uh, just my wife and I, but we have you know, uh, two children, typically one bag a week. Others will need, maybe need two. No barrels, just bags. Here we have two barrels. And then if you need more, you have this bag. There's a drawstring here. That will cinch up for your trash. So there's, there's that. All right, continue on. Um, what would the fee be for that bag, to buy those bags? So they will be at retail stores. So we will, the town will purchase those um, bags through a vendor. That vendor will distribute those to uh, retailers that we will have agreements with. And those retailers will sell at the uh, agreed upon price that will uh, will uh, determine. So they'll be sold in rolls of 10 typically. And, and this, is, this is what a roll of 10 looks like. So 10 times whatever the bag price that is determined. So uh, let's see, so residents um, will be able to, again, dispose of as many um, pounds of trash above the uh, two 50 gallon barrels as they need to per week. So they will uh, also be looking at, or we'll, we'll be looking at a couple of DEP waistband um, issues. So November 1st, there's a, a waste ban on mattresses and box springs, and there's also on textiles. So we'll be required to have uh, those things pulled from the waste stream. No more collection on uh, curbside and JRM's trash trucks. Uh, we're looking to see what options there are for other haulers to come curbside to collect. There might be more value currently in the uh, textile markets and so we're looking to speak with vendors that will go uh, by appointment to your home to collect those things. Mattresses, we were um, looking to have a, uh, a vendor or a hauler um, bid for seven communities. They actually did not get any takers so nobody bid unfortunately on that. So we're still looking for a solution on how to do the mattresses and box springs. So uh, what should the page of throw bags cost? So bags are typically sold in rolls of 10, which I sh showed you. The retail price per bag is typically priced to cover the cost of manufacturing and distribution of the bags, plus the cost to dispose of the trash that's contained in the bags. And so it's always best to provide a stable bag price if you can for a few years when determining what the retail sale of, of the price of bags will be. Uh, you should consider the rising cost of trash disposal in the coming years. So a DEP report that I recently looked at showed, you know, uh, pricing, you know, looking at 155 different municipalities. Those that are utilized in the size of bag that we intend to use uh, are pricing anywhere from two to 250. That was, again, uh, information that was current in 2020. Um, I know that Rockport recently raised their bag to three dollars. Um, but I'm looking um, at our numbers, and I think 250 would be the appropriate number to have for a, a few years. Um, and I think we will um, be able to sell, well, definitely a roll of 10 will be $25. So what are the impacts to the flat fee charge to residents and curbside trash pickup? So currently the residents for FY22 are paying $300 annually or $75 quarterly. For FY23, it's recommended that the $75 quarterly fee currently being charged to residents be kept the same. 
And although the cost of uh, solid waste disposal is going up by an estimated $41,000 next year, I think the revenues that will be generated from uh, the excess or the overflow trash uh, will, will help to reduce that cost or, or keep those costs in check. And $75 quarterly fees, I think, would be appropriate in this case. So we're looking for um, a couple of changes. So we would be looking for um, effective July 1, 2022, the weekly dis solid waste disposal limit per household is going to be up to uh, 250 gallon size barrels containing no more than 40 pounds of solid waste per barrel. The second change would be effective July 1 as well and where households requiring solid waste disposal above the established weekly limit can dispose of overflow trash using town authorized page throw bags. So we have some state requirements. So num state requirement number one, effective November 1st would be a waste ban on mattresses and box springs from being collected curbside in the solid waste. And state requirement number two, effective November 1st, 2022, textiles are banned from the curbside collection of solid waste. So the implementation of the page to throw overflow trash, I want to just touch base again. So establish the retail purchase price of a single page to throw bag. Amend the FY22 solid waste budget by transferring 50,000 is my best guess estimate at the moment from solid waste stabilization fund for the purchase of page to throw trash bags. I Meaning we need to buy those bags fairly soon if we're going to be ready for July 1. There's a six to eight week lead time to put that order in and get those bags ready to go to the retailers. So it's getting close. But I would need some, some amount of um, supplemental funding in this year's budget to do that. All right, also solicit participation in the sale of page throw bags from local retailers. So we'll go around and, and talk to local retailers. And uh, contract with page to throw trash bag vendor to manufacture and distribute distribute the bags to local retailers that will sell them to the residents. Questions and answers. Questions of my colleagues. Mr. O'Leary? No, I, I think this is a step in the right direction. And uh, we obviously have to address compliance. And I think the pay as you throw bag does that. Um, you know, I still don't see relief for the small user at this point um, we have to start somewhere and, and, and this has been a situation that we've been talking about for years and years and years and I applaud uh, Mr. Greenberg and the recycling committee and everybody in the administration for working on this so hard and our liaison to at least bring something to the table here for us to discuss and implement so yeah, I'm in favor of this first step I still would like to look at as this is going on is there some way that we can grant some relief for the small user who doesn't need 250 gallon bags and like you has one bag a week you know so um, but we can't solve that tonight and we shouldn't kick this down the road anymore and I think we should move forward so uh, again I applaud your efforts and uh, hope that you still continue to work on assisting come up with some solution to grant some relief to the small users but I say let's move forward Mr. Waller? Yeah, I guess I'm pretty disappointed. Uh, when we were talking the last time, we were talking long term going down to one barrel, 35 gallons. And now we're going the other way back up to 50, which is huge. I mean, it's really big and we're talking two. So I shared uh, Mr. O'Leary's concern, which is that for the people that are light users, which you told us is 70% of the users out there, um, they're, they're, they're supplementing for everybody else. And that doesn't seem very fair to me. So we've, we've gone the wrong, we're going the wrong way um, in barrel size, in the number of barrels, and it's not part of your long-term vision, at least that's what you told me last time you were here. Um, and so I would like to see your long-term vision, uh, which maybe that's done and you're done with it. We should know that, but again, it's not equitable to the people who put out one barrel a week. And at 50 gallons times two, that's huge. And I really, and then the other concern I have is that I know JRM is not going to have scales 
but I know people are going to be loading up their barrels, and it's probably going to be heavier than 40 most of the times. And we've already seen with our current program that JRM, with town uh, consensus, has been we're not going to leave any barrels out no matter what. Even if they violate the rules, we're still going to pick it up because we don't want to leave trash out. I think we're going to have the same abuse here again. So we haven't solved that problem. To me, we haven't solved that problem based on what we've already have historically done in the past. So to me, what you've done is just say, okay, well, all the abuses that are going on, we're going to just give a blessing to and uh, take care of everybody, and we're going the opposite of what you were trying to reduce the waste stream. I don't see that happening. In fact, you, you told us last time, as you reduce the barrel size, weight of the, barrel, weight of the waste stream goes down. We're going the other way. Our waste stream is going to go up. So I'm disappointed by what I'm hearing right now, especially without a long-term vision. All set, Mr. Walner? Yep. Mr. Stuto? Um, I have a statement and a question. First, well, just one thing, Mr. Walner. I know before, because we, we talked about it, that 70% was on bad data, right? That was based well, on... They never confirmed or... Well, they never confirmed, confirmed because then probably went back, probably realized that the idea that 70% were only using one 35-gallon barrel, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's that's unrealistic. But we can move on from that because I've been... Let's, let me move on for a second, and then uh, I'll take the rebuttal. Um, I still... Here's what I don't get. Number one, enforcement. Number two, when you look at towns that mandate barrel size, it is because the town or city has provided the barrels. It is uniform. I don't see anywhere here in the plan where we're going to do it. The average 50-gallon barrel of decent quality is $100. So, um, I don't need a calculator to say that if we have to provide 200 every household, we have to pay for this. That's how it is, unless there's some magic Home Depot sale that no one told me about. So that's my thing. How do we enforce it, right? I, I agree with Mr. Wallen, but a little differently. That this plan, to me, great. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of, you know, I mean, great from the standpoint that I don't think we're going to affect a lot of people's capacity issues, but I don't see how it gets enforced. Like, again, how, how does it get enforced? Also, then what do we do with all, let's say tomorrow we magically find the number because Ms. Herbert's a, you know, a genius when it comes to finance. I still don't know what we're going to do with all the barrels people have. There's a lot of them to then get rid of. You know, there's going to be a lot. Unless there's like, you know, probably like an idea for that. But, and then for the last piece, I agree. I mean, we started this the last time we did, we talked for... 90% of the meeting about how helping that little old lady uh, with her fee and well this is not only not going to do that but then again and maybe I'll wait for the numbers but the other question I had is I need to see the concrete data of how many people are having a hard time with the $300 a year uh, or compared to other communities this is nothing like it's like just I see it too. I know people all over different towns, and again, I just, those are the two numbers I want, and if you can give them to me tonight, that'd be great. How many people really, from the last presentation, I wrote it down, according to your data, 70% were using just one 35-gallon barrel. Yes, less that's what you said. Less than three. 70%, you said. Less than three. What do you mean less than three? Some of those 70% use two. So two, but two 35 gallon. Okay, so we should do a field trip on Tuesday morning and, we'll, and we can measure. I got some time. These are All right, Mr. Sue. But anyways, right. that's Mr. one Sue, number let's I need. Keep but that's, it, one, let's, yeah, that's fine. But let's like, keep I'm just, it to what I'm just we a need for questioning. Dead, and but that, that was like, for example, Mr. Walner had different questions that weren't answered. I had those. That wasn't, that's not in this presentation. And then number two, again, if somebody could please provide me the number from real survey of how, what is the true number of people that we surveyed that say that, you know, we have that much of an issue with what our fees at, because we're doing the best we can, but costs went up everywhere. Inflation's riding at eight, and we're trying to come up with these magical numbers. And I just, I, I, again, Mr. Manicelli, I'm not trying to be, sarcastic or forward about it, but the thing is that I want real raw data and there's none in here. Thank you. 
Mrs. Gonzalez. I think I can address most of that. Um, so I am liaison to the recycling committee and I can tell you that there have been hours upon hours upon hours of work put into this and discussion and meetings. Um, and Mr. Greenberg's done the field trips, not only to neighborhoods, but to JRM to see what trash is collected. And um, he's, he's put an enormous amount of time into this. So number one, and I think it might address Mr. O'Leary too, um, the focus right now was really on more of the abuse than the small user for right now. Um, because in fairness, that small user is looking at their neighbor who is putting out construction material and, and you know, 10 bags and it's all getting picked up. Um, so to, to address that, are these pay as you throw bags so that that extra, we have, there was no enforcement because there was no option. So are we gonna just not pick up people's extra trash and leave it there? I don't think anybody wanted to see that. So now we have an option. Now that there's an option, you have extra trash, you need to purchase this and put that extra trash in there so that it can get picked up. So the other, I'm, I'm trying to remember all the things that were brought up. Um, nobody's arguing that our fee is not low. That was brought up in many hearings. I, I did research myself on that. We really are one of the lowest fees around. I mean, that's not something that anybody should be complaining about, honestly. What we're trying to address here more is the extra trash being put out that the town is having to pay for to get picked up. So this is gonna take care of that extra trash. Now we can enforce it because if you're not putting your extra trash in these bags, then there, w there should be enforcement, and I think there will be now. Um, the reason, as far as I understand it, in the last meeting that um, the recycling committee decided to go up to the 50 gallon barrels is because of the feedback we got at the last hearing. It, all we were hearing was that I already have big barrels. I don't want to have to buy new barrels. I want to keep the barrels I have. I don't want the town telling me I can only have 35 gallon barrels when I already invested $100 in my $50 barrel and I don't want to have to get rid of it. So to appease that and to not make people upset that they have to go buy new barrels, keep your barrels. I mean, I don't think anybody has anything over a 50 gallon barrel. Oh, if you sure. do, that's a problem. <laughs> They sure do. Well, I mean, I think 250 gallon barrels is adequate for everybody. So that, that's, we were just trying to eliminate people being upset about that. So you can still keep the barrels you have, just limit the amount of trash that's gonna go in them so that they can lift them. I mean, these trash people have to lift these barrels. We don't have the, the machines that lift it for them. Um, and whatever you're gonna put over that goes in the pay as you throw back. So I, I don't know if Thank I, you. I, Thank I you. hope I covered the questions you had. Um, and we can probably go back to recycling if, if not. I think my, my understanding from the presentation was quite clear that, you know, there's a desire to, to get this into uniform, into uniformity. So the maximum is the 50, but if you have your 35 gallon, like Mrs. Gonzalez said, they're gonna pick that up. If you're putting out your, whatever, 65 gallon, I don't even know if they're that, they make them that, that's not gonna get picked up. So they're gonna bypass that. And that's gonna be the program now. So if you put your 65 gallon out, they're gonna know that it's the wrong size, they're not gonna pick it up, and you're gonna be responsible for getting rid of your trash. We're not gonna send the DPW or JRM to go get that anymore. And the other issue is we, we have to charge a fee commensurate with what the service costs the town. In this aspect, I think this is carefully tailored to address that and, it, and it's tailored to address it in an equitable manner where 
the heavy users, the heavy, the people that are dispose, disposing, you know, we heard about construction debris or seven bags on top of there, two, you know, 35 gallon or 50 gallon will buy the bag now. And that will help adjust this so that we don't have to keep going back every year to increase this because we have talked as a board about making sure that we annually look at this fee to make sure it is covering the cost. And we, that in order to do that, we're gonna have to keep going up. So in that way, it starts to achieve that equity for the little old lady, like you mentioned, because we're not gonna keep going up, up, up if we can see if this method resolves that and covers the whole cost of this, and the heavy user then is buying the bag to, to compensate for the additional cost that it's already costing the town. And the other thing I can see long term is the habit of, getting in the habit of, this is what you're allotted, you know that this is what you're allotted, that's what you're wheeling out to the curb. And ultimately, down the line, hopefully with the other recycling measures that come on board, maybe we're down to one fifty gallon. Maybe we're down to a program where we have enough in the reserve that we can offset and give a you know a you know some sort of an offset to uh, low income or you know one you know one bag granny that you like you mentioned before. So I could see this being something where it becomes a habit that that our we're getting used to residences are getting used to doing this so now they know that there's much more uniformity in it and they don't need to buy a bigger barrel if they're only using the 35 gallon it's going to fit into this program so we're not ordering them everybody has to go get a 50 gallon barrel they can still use that 35 gallon and then the ones that like i said use a lot i think it's tailored to address what we needed it to address and then there'll be the other component of this that we haven't heard yet, which is the recycling component to it. And then hopefully once we get that component rolling and people get into the habit on that component, maybe with the, we can then go down to one 50-gallon barrel to help us. Can I ask a follow-up question? For me or no, for, for... No, in general, yes. maybe. Sure. Right. Um, so, not construction. Uh, most residents don't own a construction company, but... Uh, if like once or once every couple of years somebody using like a contractor bag to like clean out a shed, like what do they do for that? Like do you just, at that point, right, that you just don't take, do you not, you, you won't take it? No, no. They, they call the DPW, they explain the special circumstances and the DPW alerts JRM to pick it up. And no cost or a cost or, I'm, I'm just curious. That's what we do right now. That's what we do right now. Well, no, I mean, right now, like, you know. I you mean, mean down the line, if, if this yeah, is Yeah, I mean, right now, if you have, like. Then they're going to buy those bags yeah. and clean out their shed with those bags. And JRM will pick up those bags. And you use those for. Then you put your idea. contractor bag inside the bag, and we're all set. Or inside the bag. We're going to have to deal with it. Well, you get paid the big bucks. Absolutely. Yes, that's fine. Mr. O'Leary, the way that the equity is achieved, no matter what your pay is for the program looks like, is by reducing the fixed fee. And in the initial case, the relief to the small user will come in the form of not having to increase that fixed fee. And as we progress, and to answer your question, yes, we have a long-term plan, and I presented it at the last hearing. The long-term plan, hopefully, is to get down to 135-gallon barrel and overflow bags, and that's when you get a real kick in of the equity, because now you're going to have enough sufficient revenue from the sale of the overflow bags possibly even reduce the fixed fee. So yes, we have a very long-term plan. Mr. Studo, I introduce you to Mr. Ed McGrath, the author of that study, who personally walked the streets of North Reading to count those barrels. I'm personally offended at your remarks. 
Well, I appreciate All right, that. No, let's not do this. No, Mr. Studo. Can you confirm Mr. that they were 35 gallons? Listen, though? Mr. Studo. That's all I'm asking. We're not, we're not, we're here for information. We're not going to jump. We're not going to do this. We're here to answer the questions. We're not going to be having an angry exchange. That's not what this is about. We have question. a lot of people. We have a lot of people that are sitting here listening, and this is inf informative for them as well as us. So, Chairman Nipelli, can you answer my question of how I want an, I, I just want an explanation of how you knew they were all 35 gallon. I mean, I just want to know, and no one wants to answer that question. It was a question of how many barrels. This one, right? The question was a question of how many trash barrels were put out, how many recycling. Containers were put out because some people use barrels, some people mm -hmm. use the bins. And the, we came to the two barrels, multiple, was, I don't have the percentage off the top of my head, but it was the majority of the houses, the like vast majority of the houses, it was two barrels or less. And then just, there's some were probably less, greater than 40, greater than 35. I'm not I'm saying they were all 35. And there was a small percentage at three, and we came down, as I recall, 195 households at three or more than three barrels total in the town. And Mr. Bogart, just okay. so you know that I'm not trying to be disrespectful about it, in the first presentation we got, there was some, there was some real confidence behind that all these barrels were only 35 gallons, well, and that's recorded. So I. Be very careful because it is recorded. We can rewind the tape. Mr. Sudo, Mr. Sudo, Mr. McGrath, Mr. McGrath, hold on a second. You asked a question. How did he know? He's giving you the answer. So there shouldn't be a back and forth about we're going to check the tape. His answer is he went around. He's gone around and he's done this work. He's done the footwork. That's the answer to the question. It's not the answer. Not, I, that's not what I'm, I'm at. I'm, I'm just, I'm just trying to state a fact that at the last meeting, I was told pretty confidently that the barrel sizes we were discussing were 35 gallon, and I'm hearing something different today. Okay, so you're hearing it from the horse's mouth who did yeah. the survey, and the survey that was done yeah. wasn't looking up DEP figures. It was actually going about the town. To, to take this information down. But directly, that's what you did, right, Mr. McGrath? Yes. Ian, Mr. McGrath is not new to us. He's been right. before <laughs> us for many years now. Yeah. Um, he's our, I would say he's our expert on this stuff. Yeah. And I think he's probably done this multiple times. I'm not gonna speak for you, but I'll ask you, how many times have you done these types of the trash the reviews in our town. Yes. So, uh, can, I, can I provide some information for the board? Yes, absolutely. Um, Why don't you come up and speak in a microphone? Nobody can really hear very well unless you talk into the microphone. Mr. McGrath, you can, yeah, that's great. So, my name's Ed McGrath at Livermore Road. I was the first chairman of the recycling committee well, 32 years ago, we talked about 32 years ago, and I recently retired as, as the recycling manager for the town of Bedford. So I wanted to provide, there were some questions, some comments made, and just for informational purposes, like the cost of the barrel. In Bedford, which is the pretty much a carbon copy of the North Reading program, about 4,500 households, one day collection. Bedford's program, they initiated in 2011, they issued a cart, 48 gallon trash cart, to every resident and they had overflow bags that were you, they, in Bedford you buy them in rolls of five and they were now it's two dollars a bag right now um, they just up up the price I just had them up the price a year or two ago um, and the way the carts were purchased and this is how these these programs are run is the hauler fronts the money to buy the carts they cost about $45 to $50 because you're buying them in bulk. And then the town reimburses the hauler over the course of a period of time. It could be three years, it could be five years, but that's how it does. And at the end of that time period, the town owns them. I can go on some, if you want to go that route, there's a, some issues to go with that. But just for the purpose of the cost of the carts, that's what it, that's what it is. It's not $100 per cart, even when you get um, replenishments inventory because plows hit the trash carts and crush them 
it still was over it's about forty five to fifty dollars per car. So I just wanted to I wanted to provide that uh, for the information. The mattress program that Mr. Reese just presented, just to get an idea the the con the, put this in the context, in Bedford, we were generating five to six hundred mattresses and box springs a year. So this is <coughs> not just a handful you know, the best thing to do is when you get a mattress delivered, have the guys take it out. That's the best way to do it. But I just wanted to give you the possible, I'd give you that figure as a scope of what DPW is going to be confronting come, no, uh, you know, November about recycling. Bedford right now, I was able to get a grant from the state, and right now they are paying for the cost of the recycling of the mattresses through that, with that grant money. But that grant excuse me, come the fall, that's still not been determined what's going to happen. But it's, uh, solid waste has become a very challenging um, and requires some creativity. And, um, you know, we can go into food waste or composting. You see these green bins around town, Black Earth. Well, long story short, they're in Bedford, too. And in calendar year 2020, roughly 160 to 200 households um, generated 60 tons of food waste that was diverted from Covanta and saved the town $4,500. So it's just, there's, that, there's a lot going on. You know, I would also say, you know, I was the enforcer of making sure people were doing, doing the right thing in Bedford. Who's doing it in North Reading? Who's driving around on Mondays making sure that the people who have opted out of the program are not putting trash out on the curb and JRM is picking it up? Who's who's enforcing it? Who's I'm just I'm, well, that's I'm, not, I'm not asking I'm not saying you know it's an issue with North Reading's not alone in that. I've been in meetings with DEP officials and they have all these great ideas and I said that's great. Look around the room, how many full time people are there? And there's count them on one hand. So it's it's a challenging challenging issue, but I just wanted to give the board some facts that I know through my experience. Thank you. Thank you, Madrid. Do we have another component to this presentation that you're going to give us? Or is it, are you good? <laughs> are you all done? Um, are we all done? I, th this concludes the solid okay. waste. You may good. have you know, further discussion, and I don't know if you um, would be putting a motion on the table. But. Well, I don't know if we're done with questions yet or comments. <laughs> Mr. O'Leary. I mean, Mr. Walner, I'm sorry. Well, both okay. Mr. Walner right. and then Mr. O'Leary. So, so I, want, I want to see you be successful. I really do. And I really think that if you want to change behavior, if your goal is to end up at 35 gallons, don't tell people it's okay to buy 50 now, and then five years from now, tell them 35. Tell them where the town's going in five years. And if we have to build up, I think it's suggested by you, I'm sorry, your name is Mr. McGrath. M Mr. McGrath, that maybe we create an inventory of official uh, you know, uh, barrels that people can buy when they're replacing the ones they have, and you do this over a five-year transition period. But if you tell them 50 gallons, people are going to buy 50 gallons. And if your goal is in five years to go down to 35, it's going to be a hard, it's going to be a hard sell. So change, we have, you know, set up the long-term vision, educate the town about it. I, I, I appreciate everything you're saying, and I appreciate the work you've done. I just think long-term, if you say 50 gallons now, it's going to be really hard in five years to get them to go to 35. I just don't, I, I, it's going to be painful. We're just extending the pain. So let's start the program now to say in five years we're going to be there and give people plenty of time. Trash barrels don't last forever. Eventually they wear out and have to be replaced. A suggestion. Okay, Mr. Wong. Mr. Mr. Wong, are you all set? Yes. Mr. S Mr. O'Leary. Uh, again, I'm endorsing what's being proposed here. And and I, and I did hear at the last meeting that they do have a long-range plan and what the long-range goals are, are going to be. And I don't disagree that we should be projecting those goals now, sooner rather than later, that you know, the goal is to get down to one barrel. And at some point, I hope, that we'll be able to adjust the fee down, downward, as Mr. Greenberg pointed out, to really assist. But this is a first step from an enforcement standpoint and the heavy users paying more than everybody else right now. We can't, at this point, reduce the fee, which is really going to help the, the low-end user. We can't afford to do that right now. But as this takes off and more of the heavy users are subsidizing it, we can see what that's going to be. It's going to stabilize the fee and potentially lower it. So I see that as, as 
a positive, and that's why we should endorse this. But I, I do believe we should be projecting uh, a little better here from us um, what, the, what the long range goals and objectives of the Re Recycling Committee are, which is again, reducing it down to one barrel and getting people to compost and do other, take other measures, which is gonna help everybody along the way. So to me, as I said, let's stop kicking it down the road and let's start uh, doing something, and this is something, and again, it, it does help address the equity issue to the extent that the heavy user is going to be paying more. It doesn't address it from the standpoint of assisting the low users, giving them a tax, giving them a break now. But th that's okay. This is, this is better because this is going to give us a real measurement of the heavy users, the volume that they have, and then we'll be able to make the adjustments later. So I say, you know, let's embrace it. Mr. Studo, <laughs> Mrs. Gonzalez, anything else? I just want to thank the Recycling Committee, who, let's remember, are volunteers. Don't get paid to put all this time and effort in. And they've worked very hard on this, so I just want to thank them for their efforts. Yeah. No, I mean, I'll just add, because everything's already been said, and we can talk about trash until the wee hours of the morning, and we have talked about trash <laughs> yeah. until pretty late. But I, I think we're going to, there are some things that we're going to have to, you know, <coughs> they're going to be mandated, just like the mattress and the textiles. There are going to be things that we are not, we're trying to catch up with now that are going to be mandated anyway. So that's going to be, that's going to alter the program in and of itself. So that's going to alter costs and fees and what can be taken and what can't be taken. And I think we should be directing our vendor who we've hired to do this work this is our program requirements and that's it and and as as much public service announcements as can be had to let people know this have to be done so that they understand 50 or less two maximum <coughs> buy the bags if you want to throw out more and it won't be picked up and we also have to let the public know about the the mattress that mattress mandate. Those aren't even coming from the town. Those are coming from an outside agency that we have to follow now. So I think down the line we're going to see a lot more of that just in terms of the environmental goals that the committee is trying to achieve in the future. So we're catching up as far as I'm concerned and we should we should really be adhering to what the, the recycling committee is is promoting instead of you know waiting and waiting and waiting we should be 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 much more proactive before it gets mandated so that we already have people online and understanding and in the habit of doing it the way that it should be done but so thank you thank you all for coming and giving us the input and all the work that you you've done on this too we really appreciate it are you here for the next thing too Yes. Are we going to take action on this? There, there is a motion. I know. I was just asking, uh, Mr. Gilberto. Is there anything else? All set. Good. We've talked enough on that topic. Do we have a motion? Yeah, and I'm putting the recommended 250. That's a, it's a total. Yes, please. Yes, two dollars and fifty cents. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I move to approve a curbside solid waste collection effective July 1st, 2022, as follows. Annual household rate of $300 annually billed quarterly. Trash limit of 250 gallon barrels per household. Maximum weight of 40 pounds per barrel. PSC throw bags for trash and that's of two barrels at a rate of $2.50 per bag. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo. Second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Oh, I mean. Yeah. Mr. Walner. No. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. We have our next order of business, which is. My glasses. Sorry. To review the. Department of Public Works 2022 construction plans. It's a pretty long day. <laughs> uh, I mean, I saw you at 8, 15.
Okay, um, so continue on the Department of Public Works project updates. So we have a few things we just like to uh, provide a little bit more detail on, and um, Mark, you can help a little bit on this one. How's that? Okay. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have, um, first of all, engineering division road construction updates. So um, we will be repairing. Uh, resurfacing some roadways and we have for the spring through the summer of 2022 roads to be reclaimed with <coughs> the existing funds that we have now uh, already appropriated Mount Vernon Street which I've already talked to that's going to be um, from Havel Street to Park Street and Elm Street Washington Street to Haverhill Street section of uh, 2600 feet there uh, also uh, what we be scheduling for the, I guess, uh, first underground utility work, uh, what would it be water lines or um, storm drains. Um, that work will begin in uh, summer of 2022 with final paving in the spring of 2023. Again, this would require um, approval of the requested funds at the June 2022 town meeting to get this Slater Roads done, but that would be Gordon Road, Green Street, uh, Cold Springs Road, Linwood Ave, Rock Street, Sandspur Lane, Surrey Lane, MacArthur Road. Your old neighborhood, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they need to be redone. <laughs> and there's a lot more out there that needs to be biggest, redone, obviously. Pools in, on, <laughs> on some of those roads. Um, so th this is what we've targeted. We have out years as well that you know we'll provide more detail later. But hopefully, with an appropriation approval in June 2022, this is what we could get accomplished. So now, water division project update. So, um, Mark, I don't know if you want to provide any details. We want to take the mic so, so you don't. Madam Chair, I think we. We, we, we covered that. Right. Yeah, it, it, it sort of does. I think the uh, North Street Mount Vernon. Um, We've talked about that, the uh, permanent trench repair, um, Mount Vernon to be completely reconstructed, chemical feed station, Main Street water main upgrades from Burroughs to um, North Street, Shady Hill, water main replacement. So, that's it. Oh, perfect. I know <laughs> it, huh? Um, I think that there's an impression that you, we can say, you know, fix fix Main Street and, you know, we can just pop, pop, have money and fix Main Street. Can you explain, can you explain a little bit about how there's a schedule of this that's been in place? So there's roads that are tackled <coughs> annually and there's capital improvement projects. Sure. On an I annual basis and Chapter 90 funds on an annual basis and there's a schedule of roads that's long been in place for work to be done and replacement, et cetera. Can you give us a little bit of that? I'll, I'll give you a, a quick rundown on that. Just very, as briefly as you can, because we have Okay, so, so um, most communities will do a, an assessment of their roadways. They'll develop, you know, a condition assessment of their roadways, a pave, and a pavement management plan will be, be developed. So what roads do uh, you want to do? When do you want to do them? What type of repairs will you be doing? Cost estimates are developed for each of those roads. Um, as you're requesting, in any um, you know, fiscal budget, uh, a sum of money to do repairs or an operating budget, in this case, roadway repairs, you're looking for uh, typically a five-year plan. You're producing information uh, you know, up to five years. Any more than that, I, I guess, really gets too you know, soft and squishy to really be accurate. But uh, you know, finance um, committees and, and uh, treasurer collectors and you know, all that want to know what are we going to be spending, you know, this coming year and in the out years. So we have um, that five year plan uh, in place. We request, based on a certain list of roads, a certain amount of money based on the repairs that we intend to be doing on that roadway. And if it gets funded, we can move forward with that plan. If it doesn't, then we can't. Now, there are two sources of funding the um, local funds that are typically through um, uh, tax dollars, but also the state kicks in what's called Chapter 90 funds. So each year, the town of North Reading tends to get about $500,000 a year. In road repair costs, it's not much. Um, you know, the town puts in more than that, many times more, two, three times more typically, 
um, to try to get the work done, or else it falls behind. The conditions of the roads get worse, not better. And so, you know, the plan is try to get enough funding, try to do enough repairs, try to make the roads better than they were uh, the previous year, and not depreciate more. In you see what happens in the winter with potholes. If you don't uh, have the proper repairs, proper funding, it just gets worse. How's that? Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Great. All right. Any questions for Mr. Gracie? All set? Mm -hmm. Mr. All set, Mr. Wallner? All, All set. set. Mr. Sudo? Mm -hmm. Ms. Gonzalez? All set. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the update. Thanks, Joe. Mr. Gilbert, all set to move on? All right. We're moving on to the next order of business, which is a review of the revenue and expen expense plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, FY23. I'm just going to be very brief because you did receive a detailed presentation um, at the last meeting. Uh, I will just share that the finance director and I continue to work with the financial planning team to work towards a balanced budget recommendation for the fiscal year 2023 operating budget. Um, we have. Um, increased our, our projection for um, Chapter 70 education aid based on some conversations that we've had with the legislative delegation and we, th we think that we'll know more about what the exact numbers will be um, come Wednesday when the House of Representatives releases its budget recommendation. A um, couple of uh, internal things that we've done within the budget, uh, some areas where we have one-time costs that we can um, move to be funded by free cash. Um, in accordance with acceptable standards. Uh, we're gonna recommend doing those things, including a snow and ice deficit from this current fiscal year that would be carried over into the future fiscal year. Um, also looking to um, identify items within both the school and municipal budgets that are one time in nature that we can fund with the free cash, which uh, continues to not be certified by the Department of Revenue as they scrutinize, um, like many communities, uh, many different moving parts associated with the CARES Act funding that we received. Um, going back uh, over the past couple of fiscal years, uh, but we do expect to have uh, that number certified any day now. Um, so that will put us in a position to be able to cover a number of one-time costs. Um, what that means uh, on the municipal side of the budget is, uh, you know, we're looking at a, a gap of about $772,000, which is down uh, from uh, just uh, under $1.1 million as of two weeks ago. Um, within that is about $550,000 of new requests and while our approach will not be to immediately uh, reduce those new requests, that'll certainly be a strong factor that we'll need to consider as we go through the process. And the finance director and I will be looking at, at options in the next two weeks um, and uh, be coming back with a recommendation to balance the budget for the municipal and um, uh, potentially in two weeks, if not no later than when the warrant is signed on May 9th. Um, and we'll be uh, doing that um, again over the past, the next couple of weeks. The school committee has begun its work and workshop um, to try to identify a priority list. Uh, I think that um, when you were, well, you know, they have some challenges ahead of them. I think that the information we provided at the financial planning team meeting on Friday um, was an improvement from the situation, a significant improvement from where they were looking to, to, to be, which is certainly good news. Um, so there'll be more to come uh, over the next few weeks as we get toward a balanced budget, and we will get there uh, in time for the June town meeting. Um, and uh, we will continue to keep the board and the community uh, updated. Uh, I am covering uh, from the finance director this evening who uh, was uh, with us earlier, um, is uh, a bit under the weather and so I uh, relieved her of having to stick around uh, into the evening um, so you, you get the, the, the half rate <laughs> preview from me. But uh, again, we went through it in detail at the last meeting so I was comfortable that I think everyone knows where we're at. Okay, thank you. Questions about this? All set? Mm -hmm. All right, we are... Um, Next order of business is to review the draft warrant for the June 6, 2022 Spring Annual Town Meeting. Do you have um, anything for the I screen? Do. I can put it up on the okay. screen. I have the uh, document itself. And uh, this is uh, effectively going to be um, a full text version of the list <laughs> that you saw at uh, the last meeting. Um, and I can provide an update on a number of the articles as well. What's the final date for which we would be voting on these? Uh, I'm anticipating that it would be voted on uh, to be signed 
uh, and then subsequently mailed to the residents um, either May 2nd or May 9th. I think everyone can see my <coughs> screen here. Uh, I am going to, um, if it's okay with you, Madam Chair, I'm going to go right through the first 20 or so articles that are routine uh, in nature. For those who, who may not be familiar, we, we will post the draft warrant on the town, uh, town website this week. More importantly, once it's actually a final form, you will get a copy of it in the mail um, through um, uh, the post office as is required under the town's um, bylaws and charter. Uh, but uh, we're going through a draft right now. Again, these first 20 articles are their ministerial acts um, that we do at each um, budget. Um, two of them are significant in cost because they're the town's annual operating budget and uh, capital budget as well. But um, I'm going to focus on the things that are outside of the, annual, uh, of the normal process, uh, which are later in the warrant. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilbert. So I'll scroll through. Again, going through, um, taking us right up to Articles 21 and 22, which would be a potential uh, funding request for continuing ongoing litigation relative to the middle high school construction project, as well as uh, 20 Elm Street proposed Chapter 40B housing development. Uh, at this point, we are not anticipating requesting additional funding. However, um, those are both active uh, court cases and anything can change. And so we have historically left those warrant articles on um, from one town meeting to the next, regardless of whether we think there will need to be funding or not. Um, and for those in the room who may not know, um, in the event we get to the town meeting date and we don't need to have uh, any funds appropriated, the select board offers a motion to pass over the article, which means we just go to the next one. Articles 23 and 24, um, really the language implementing what I had mentioned uh, in the meetings, uh, trying to look at, at the request of the select board, areas where we could provide additional property tax relief uh, to our residents. One area is for disabled veterans. We're able to recommend going to the maximum uh, exemption. Uh, right now we're at $400 and the statutory maximum is $800. So that's what Article 23 would do and the Board of Assessors will be asked to make a further presentation of this article at, uh, at the next meeting. The same thing for Article 24, which is a property tax deferral program. So this is not uh, waiving or exempting any portion of the taxes, but simply delaying its payment. Um, currently, we have a, a, an income limit that's pretty low. You see it there as um, $20,000, and we're looking to increase that to the statutory maximum um, allowed, which is actually the same statutory maximum for the circuit breaker law, um, circuit breaker uh, tax um, credit that's available to seniors at the state level. So again, trying to offer another avenue. Again, it does not waive the taxes. It simply allows them to be deferred until a point in time, generally when the property is sold. Um, so and I want to recognize the Board of Assessors and, and Deb Cavoni for responding to this request that we brought up at the tax classification hearing in November and making these recommendations. <coughs> Mr. Gilberto, yes. this has been, we, the Board's been pushing for this for a long time. Did this require a vote of the Board of Assessors? Am I if it's sponsored on this warrant article, does that mean that they voted to? My, my understanding is that they've been supportive of it. If they've submitted a formal vote on, on it, I, I'm, I'm not certain um, okay. whether they've actually done that or not. But would they have to by the time this? We, we, we would is probably approved. require them to, to do okay. that. Um, and the same will be for an upcoming article as well, which I'll refer to. Okay. Um, the. Um, Next article would be to update our general bylaw relative to alarm systems, particularly the, the fee uh, and the structure of the fee, uh, which right now is um, stipulated to be $300. This would allow it to be set by the fire department's fee schedule in accordance with the uh, state law, Chapter 40, Section 22F. And um, the chief will be present at, at the next meeting to go in further detail, but his intention is to try to allow us to modernize the fee structure to reflect our intention to transition to the wireless radios rather than the wired radios provided incentive for folks to, uh, to do that. Um, so he'll be able to provide more for us at the next meeting. I won't rehash the conversation on the sewer betterment bylaw. Um, we've identified areas that need to be updated and the DPW director is working with town council to offer us some language that will be available to you. Um, two articles that have been submitted um, that uh, are uh, you know, not part of the recurring Process one is for funding for a forestry consultant uh, from the town's forestry committee, which uh, after being inactive has become uh, much more active in recent um, uh, months. Um, and uh, we're going to ask them to come forward to present uh, what they're looking for exactly to do with that program. 
uh, based upon the, the Warren article language. I can tell you that my understanding of their efforts is to try to make accessible, make more accessible to existing uh, passive recreation facilities that we have um, that are in need of some maintenance work. Um, I know they've been looking at that. I, I know Mr. Walner is also a liaison on that committee. I don't know if there's anything that he has to add to that as a, as a liaison. Um, anything further on that? Did I get that right? No, Swan Pond specifically. Yeah. Okay. was focused on making it more accessible. Yep. Is there a specific amount attended yeah, we're to this? We're thinking the consultants to be around 50000 for what we need to do to, to come up with a good plan. Shouldn't that be in the article? Or we can't yeah. that. We're, just, we're just not there yet with the number yet, so. We're just waiting. Okay. It's so this is going to be modified? Yes. With the it's a specific figure once yes. the forestry committee finishes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And, and then the final article um, for which I know there's been discussion of the project at a recent meeting, appropriating funding for uh, rail trail uh, design and plans. Um, this is something that's been submitted on the behalf of the Land Utilization Committee. Um, I know that they had two meetings scheduled for last week, I think only one of which may have happened jointly with the Recreation Committee. They have a, a meeting scheduled virtually for tomorrow evening where they will be providing, uh, uh, where the Land Utilization Committee itself will receive an update relative to the Rail Trail pro uh, project and presumably provide some feedback to the uh, consultant that's working on the project. So um, there's work that they said that they would do at the last meeting. I think many of you were here and heard uh, Ms. Mullen stand up and indicate that, and I have spoken with the chairperson, and it is their intention to not only have a public discussion of the project in detail tomorrow evening, but also schedule a public hearing in which the public would be able to come and speak and comment further specifically on the details of the plan. Um, and I know he's working, I believe, with the, uh, the school department relative to the appropriate venue, probably, but would be a room in the middle high school so we can better accommodate the larger group that we expect to be there. Um, so there will be more to come, I think, on that, um, through that, that venue. Um, uh, and something important to note, again, this article was submitted on behalf of the Land Utilization Committee. Um, they will be uh, formally considering um, their uh, position on the article um, as soon as tomorrow evening or at a future meeting. And so we'll look for anything further that they have to offer for us um, between now and the signing of the warrant. Um, and once they've concluded that process, Madam Chair, through you, my plan would be to ask them to come back and provide an update to the select board. That probably won't be at the next meeting. It will probably be a couple meetings out. It, it won't be before we have to sign this, though? It would be before you sign it, but probably not on the 25th. Okay. Uh, I just I don't know that they'll have concluded the public outreach that I think they need to do to be candid with okay. you. Okay. All right. Okay, any questions for my colleagues on these? And then we're going to, we did talk about a special meeting for the sewer. I think once we get all of the updates that we talked about, we'll have to plan for that, which is going to be in late fall. What did we say, October? October, November. Yeah. Oh, yeah. October, yes. November. Okay. Correct. All right. I will note for the record that we did receive um, uh, letters, a uh, number of letters from residents on Article 28. And <coughs> I just want to make sure. I won't read them into the record, but I want them to be made a part of the record for us. We, we, Mr. Berkmeyer, Mr. Donahue, Mr. Delisle, and there were attached to Mr. Berkmeyer's were several letters from other residents of the, what we knew or we understood to be the proposed location that we asked LUC to go back on redesign up. So hopefully they'll unveil a redesign at their meeting tomorrow. But I do want to make sure we put that on the record because they, they were sent to all of us. So we did receive them and we want to make that a part of this where it was directed because we were doing the, the warrant article review this evening. And with that, we're going to go to public comment. So let's hear from anybody here or in attendance that would like to speak in public comment. Do we have anyone? I, I'd just like to say a couple of words to everybody. Everybody know? Oh, what do you want? Sure, that's fine. Sure, either, okay. one, either one. If you pick a um, mic, any mic, please. You all know how I if feel. If you could please Oh, name. I'm Stephen Delisle. Yes. Three Mount Vernon Street. Okay. Um, with my letters that I've sent out, you know mm -hmm. how I feel. Totally 110% against taking my property. It's considered with Phil and Mr. Wong too, an abandoned railroad bed. I invite 
the board, <laughs> everybody, come by my property. I will gladly show you my lawn that is considered abandoned. It is by no means an abandoned railroad bed. It is my yard. They are suggesting to take the railroad bed from the abandoned part of it and take it across my yard, cut my yard literally by one third so it's totally useless to me. And that just can't happen. It, it can't happen. Come by and I'll show you what they're planning to do. You can't see it with a little picture. He's taking the yard and cutting it in a third, which makes it, we can't use it anymore. That's not what North Reading's about. You're all invited, though. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delisle. And we do have, we, we are, put your letter on record. We yeah, did all you. receive right. it. Okay. And when you go by in the parade, you come right by my corner. I'll show you where <laughs> it's going to go. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Gilberto? Madam Chair, and I, I apologize for taking us back one agenda item, but did you mention correspondence from Mr. Donahue as well? Yes. Okay, thank you. Matthew Donahue, yes, yes, <coughs> and Mr. Berkmeyer. And I think Mr. Berkmeyer's had other letters yeah. attached to it. Yeah. So yes. I wanted. As did Mr. Donahue. I didn't write all those down, but I do know there were several signers, several signatories to those letters. So we just want to make that a part of our record, okay? Um, do we have anyone in uh, anyone else? Please come forward if you could state your name and your address for the record. Barbara Nicosia, by Railroad Ave. This proposal trail goes in the middle of my property and right down. I own across the street. My garage is across the street. And he's saying that it's abandoned trail, it's not true. I mean, it's true, it's, there's nothing there anymore. And I spoke to a couple condo people that they built the condos at the beginning, had no idea that this was going on, that they were proposing to go down, and I said, down in the middle of where you guys drive, to park your cars, to my house, and at the end, a railroad out are two houses that have been abandoned. Well, they were bought by someone else in town and they haven't been torn down. And it's old growth and the trail that they're talking about at the end, the little strip that goes to Steve Steve's property goes through there. But it's like this. But I'm not sewing. I'm not, I don't want it. I don't want this going between my property at all. I don't. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming forward. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? <coughs> Oh, Mr. John, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I just my only question I'm, you know, I know we have more meetings coming from the utilization committee I think tomorrow's is just virtual which is unfortunate I wish it was you know, something we could go to in person um, I just does the board have any plans on addressing the misinformation that was spread online on Facebook by other board members I don't think we're I don't think we have a plan to, to answer your question because I'm not sure that that should be something the board is here on right now. Right now sure. we're trying to take public comment okay. and I, I, don't, I don't know that anyone needs to address that. I don't know if Mr. Gilberto, did you, do you, want, did you get back to Mr. Donahue? I, I do think, so a couple of things that I would offer. Sure. First is, and for, for everybody who is here and who offered, uh, who's offered comment again, there is a virtual land utilization committee tomorrow evening. Um, I would encourage you all to attend. I would also advise that it's unlikely that there will be a public comment period, but you'll at least be able to witness the discussion and the briefing provided to the Land Utilization Committee. To your second question, I've spoken with the Chair, and I believe it is his intention to have an in-person meeting where the public can come and offer their comments with regard to this. Um, I think that that is a, a great place to try to clear up any concerns or, or confusion about what's going on with the project, and I've asked the Land Utilization Committee to do that. Sure. 
<coughs> excuse me, um, this has been their project. They were the sponsor of the initial article going back three years ago. And um, you know, I think that, it, it, that, that they ought to be briefed as to your concerns. Uh, and I'm, trust me, they're aware <laughs> at this point, but I'm sure they'll become even more aware um, as they go through their process. And that was the meeting you just mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. That you're trying to coordinate in a bigger yes. area that can, you know, that everyone can attend. I hope that they do a, of, we, we asked them after the last meeting, which uh, most of you were at, not all of you, but most of you were at, to kind of go back and, and try to reconfigure this. Is there another pathway? Mm -hmm. And I hope if they do that, that they also get that drone footage so that we can understand this, so we can see what Mr. Delisle and Ms. Nicosia are explaining with regard to actually where it crosses on their paths, if it's still planned to be going in that route. Um, but we did ask them that. And, and as far as misinformation, we are doing the best that we can to explain everything what we know and I believe that they are not just setting up one public meeting but they're going to be doing you know a number of these to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to, to hear this right. so that's that's Mr. Mr. Gilberto I don't know if there's anything else you want to yeah, add. So and I just want to follow up because I know you had asked some questions as well which we will be giving you a response with regard to some of your specific questions about the procedure and the open meeting law as well. Sure. Um, you know, we haven't we haven't forgotten about your questions with regard to that. But you know please just you know part of the process and part of ensuring the process remains transparent is even though a meeting might not necessarily be a hearing in which the comment takes place, it's public. Right. And it's your opportunity to, to hear what's being said, and even if you can't offer And I've said this very comment to the chair of the committee as well, so I'm not, not mincing any words um, you know, with anybody. I, I think I would encourage you, if you have concerns about the project, please participate in that meeting, even Absolutely. though it's virtual. And even yeah. though you may not be able to, to ask questions at that meeting, um, you know, that, that moment, that opportunity is coming uh, sooner rather than later. It may be this follow-up question with that, and this might not be the right venue to do it, but I think it might help others here just to know what the process is for this moving forward. So if, you know, the Land Utilization Committee has these meetings, there's still plenty of, you know, public concern and, you know, many people who have easements who don't want to give it up. Does that still find its way onto the June, more the June meetings and still go to a public vote? How, what's that process like? And if that's, this isn't the right avenue to talk about that right now, it's okay. I'm happy to offer comment, and again, it's the, the, the ultimate decisions lie before the five people to my right, sure, right yeah, here. Yeah, um, but I, I will just say this: you know, one of the things that the, the land utilization committee is going to discuss is its its status with regard to this project and how it feels about this project. The chairman did share that with me, so they will have that conversation yeah. and they will advise us as to what their status is with regard to that, whether it's you know continued support for the project or whether it's some other feeling. Sure. That's something that I think the select board you know, is going to let the land utilization committee determine. The next step is the warrant needs to be approved and signed by the select board members <coughs> before it gets mailed to your house. Um, so you know they determine what articles are on that warrant. Right. And then even if an article is on that warrant, the final step for the select board is whether they're recommending that article or not. So they have regularly placed on the warrant articles for which they do not offer a favorable recommendation. Yep. And I, mean, I can tell you from my experience that often is a very significant signal to town meeting. And, what generally will happen is if they're not recommending, they'll actually move to pass over the article. So they have to vote to determine that. But that's why would what you post it on the, just for curiosity, why would you post it if it wasn't, if the board wasn't for it? Because so we can only make a recommendation. So and you don't people that show up in the town mm -hmm. meeting are the ones that make the ultimate decision. Yeah. So when you go to the town meeting, you'll see what the finance committee recommends, the select board recommends, right. sometimes school committee recommends. We could say pass over, sure. but if, the town rules and the town doesn't want to pass over and it wants to vote in favor or, or oppose it. They, that is just a recommendation. Right. And that's the vote is what matters. The vote of the, of the town is what matters. If it votes no in June, can it get put back on in October or next year? Mr. Gilberto. <laughs> in its exact form, only with the approval of the Finance Committee. It, needs to, it would need to wait a year, uh, I believe, if I have that right, Madam. Ms. Hurl, but I can't hear you. He was asking if it, if, it, if it was not approved in June, could it be put back on the warrant in October? And I said in the exact form, no, it would need to be approved by the Finance Committee in order for that to happen. Yes, but I think there's another thing where you can cause preventing it from coming back at the same time. Yes, I think you're right. It doesn't usually happen. Right. 
Yes. Right. But it's only recommendations. What sure. matters is what people vote. Who, sh who, how many people show up, right. and who votes on it. Because yeah. we, we're only the shepherds of the in the warrant articles getting to the town, to the town, to the town meeting. Sure. Well, we obviously vote too, but. Of course. Uh, Mr. O'Leary's got his hand up, and I think he's our resident expert on yeah. town. No expert. Process. I've just been around a long time. <laughs> <laughs> he's no, been it, through it, many town yeah. meetings. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the the board can can take it off. You know, we can take it off. But let me tell you what's happened in the 30 years that I've been here. We don't. You know, because as a courtesy to other volunteer boards, committees, and commissions, if they have something that they feel is important to bring forth for consideration to the the board <laughs> and to the community as a whole. It only takes, for a citizen's petition, it only takes 10 signatures. We don't force them to go out and put on a citizen's petition. They're putting in hundreds and hundreds of hours a year volunteering, you know, their services. And if they think it's important for the public <coughs> to make a decision on it, we're going to extend that courtesy and put it on there. But then we're also going to make a recommendation to town meeting. Sometimes we endorse it and sometimes we don't, you know. And so you'll hear that recommendation as the chair pointed out at town meeting. But, you know, I for one would, would not sit here and say, don't put it on. You know, to me, they deserve the courtesy of, of being heard and presenting what they think is important to the community. So it's, uh, and then ultimately, again, it is up to town meeting. Yeah. As the chair said, you know, we'll make a recommendation, either for or against, or, or move to pass it over. And then if we move to pass it over, town meeting can say, if this has happened, no, we're not going to pass it over. We're going to vote it down. You know, or no, we're not going to pass it over. We're going to act favorably on this because the people who go to town meeting think it's important. So. That's the process, um, and I would expect that the, the board would be courteous towards the Land Utilization Committee, but at the same time, during this hearing process, which is tomorrow night and a couple of future dates, um, the LUC is going to have to assess whether or not they think it's an appropriate time to move forward with this and if they're likely to have a, a favorable action on it. Right. Or if they're going to take a different route, maybe sell that project. But, you know, this is what's going to get flushed out in the next yeah. six weeks, uh, I would say. So. I hope that's helpful. No, it is. No, thank you. I think that helps a lot for, yeah. for people to understand the process. And again, until I see the final map as to what's going to be presented, I'm going to reserve my judgment. Sure. I mean, I endorse the plan. I think I think a real trail is a huge would be a huge asset to the community, um, but obviously it's going to have impacts on, on different property owners, and that's important to, to look at, recognize, assess, and then make determinations. So until we I see a final map in front of me. I'm not going to make, I'm going to withhold my recommendation. Conceptually, I like the idea. I think everybody the other night pretty much endorsed the idea, but some of the, uh, the methodology that's gone about and the actual location of some of it was called into question, and that's being assessed now. Right. Or reassessed, let's put that. How's that? Good. No, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Right. Anybody else would like to? Sure. Oh. Welcome. Hi, um, Mary Garlock, Woodland Drive, number 17. Um, I just want to make it clear that I do oppose this. I know you said you thought everybody here the other night liked the idea. I, I don't know who that is, but I don't. And I'm losing sleep over this. This is making me physically ill to think that this could be going on in the back of my property. And as an abutter, who was not informed, um, I'd like it to go into the record that abutters were not notified of this. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> Mr. Bergmeier. Mr. Smith. Oh my God, Mr. Smith, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't believe for a second that this thing has got this far. People in this community have worked year after year after year trying to beautify their property, make it nice so they got nice backyards, nice front yards, nice whatever out of the lot you probably want to talk about. And you're talking about $12 million of our tax dollars to put a walkway on the back of everybody's house so they can everybody from Linfield, Wakefield, Wilmington can walk around and ride around in a snowmobile in the wintertime with all that noise and racket and everything else. But what really gets me is there's been no, um, there's no, been, been no transparency at all. The LUC met 23 times in the last two years with no, no outside 
input for, for whether they like this deal or they don't like this deal. If you looked around this room last week or two weeks ago, whenever we were here, the place was packed. There wasn't one person in that audience, because I talked to every one of them, who was in favor of this deal. If it's such a good deal, why wasn't there some help here for you people? But the people down on Williams Road, for instance, they're living on 20,000 square foot house lots. Those are to be uh, zoning. It's a, uh, yeah, to be. And it's, so it's 20,000 square feet. If they go through their yards and take 1,800 1, or 2,000 square feet, they've created a non-conforming lot. But nobody cares about these people. They just march in and, and do whatever they want to do. Um, I, for one, I, I had 112 acres of land in, down on Elm Street. The town of North Reading came in and took 50 acres of my property. This is the fifth time they've been after my family for taking something, they need a road, or they need this, or they need that. They went and cut, I had two bridges built by me and my father in the 70s across the Ipswich River. We built them by hand. It was a lot of money, it was a lot of expense, and a lot of time. The town of North Reading sent the employees down there with chainsaws and they cut their bridges so my wife can't drive from the house to get her mail. She has to go around Washington Street. And it's crazy. This is the craziest thing I ever saw in my life that anybody could put this on without the transparency. And this board too. You people haven't said a word to anybody outside. Nobody knew it. I talked to three people today on Burdett Road. I said, do you really know anything about this uh, walkway? What about walkway? And I explained the whole thing. He said, hey, crazy. That's $12 million, and that's only phase one. And then you're worried about $50 for a trash bag. But anyway, I, I could sit up here and complain about it. But all, all I can say is, I would wish, how, how can you put something on a warrant when you haven't had any discussion with anybody in the town. Yeah. How do you do that? How can you put that and realistically say, we're going to schedule an article 28 to uh, warrant article 28 and raise $12 million from the people and take, a, take away all their rights, all their privacy, and, and just leave it? Leave it. How can you do that? When is there going to be a meeting? Have you got something scheduled? There's a meeting tomorrow night. You what? Tomorrow the night, the Land Utilization Committee meets tomorrow night. I'm they, sorry. The, the Land Utilization Committee will meet tomorrow night. And again, I would encourage everybody here to attend that meeting. They will also schedule a public hearing where the public can provide input. It will be in person, most likely at the middle high school. The other thing that's real, I don't know how many of you know who's on the LUC, but the chairman of the LUC lives in Tewksburg. I mean in Topsfield. He's making decisions for us to spend our money. Why do we want to spend money, spend it in Topsfield? We don't need it. We've got plenty of people that are very smart if they want to put a little trail in. But to take a guy from Tewksbury, from, from Topsfield, and make him chairman of the board, and make all these fancy plans, and not have a meeting. There's not a, not a single meeting about it, anything. He just eyes you know, it was well hidden. I'm glad a friend of mine actually stumbled on it. I mean, he brought it down to my house one. He said, do you see this thing with the LLC is going? I said, I didn't even know it. And, it, and you, here it is coming up in a town meeting in June. There hasn't been once outside the meeting. That's all I can say. I, I could, I could do, do so many things I would love to say. All right. right. You're showing great restraint tonight, Billy. All yeah. right. <laughs> Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. It may have been hard to hear over here, but there's a virtual meeting tomorrow night for LUC about this. There's going to be a public meeting in person about this. Hopefully within the next couple of weeks. The truth of the matter is, it should have been already. No, I, I, it's. We heard your comment, and we heard your comment the last <coughs> week that we're, we're addressing this. So we heard you. 
Well, but you. we want to make sure that you are aware too, because it's hard to hear over here. So I hope you guys listen because it's important. This is the most. It's, by the way, it's the most expensive project the town of North Reading ever has to have. All right, let's let's. To build a high school all right, Mrs. Smith, we just need to make sure everyone has a chance. Also, does anyone else? Does anyone else? <laughs> That's okay. That's what public comment is called. Ralph Samard, 90 Park Street. I live next to the Delisles. Um, we learned a lot. I think everybody here has as far as how this works. Um, some of it works, some of it doesn't work. Um, I was listening to Mr. O'Leary say that we just kind of pass them on. To me, that's very disappointing. We're able to give you folks our public in input. Tomorrow night, we get none, once again. We've been asked nothing about anything. So some of the, some of the things that came up in the last meeting from, um, from the gentleman presenting was, you already spoke to the postal department and they're on, in favor of it. Spoke with the uh, Lions Club over on Carter. They're in favor of it, they have no problem. But then on the other side of the table, he says that he's unable to talk to anybody through legal counsel. So how do you get to talk to the U United States Postal Department and the Lions Club without being able to talk to any neighbors? So that's, that's disappointing there. Um, to just rubber stamp something to put it through to waste more time is, is wrong. You folks are our gatekeepers here. Um, and if you see uh, injustice such as this going forward, that there's clearly not the information out there for either side. Cle clearly not the people against it. I always thought the, the purpose of the, the feasibility studies to get both sides, to bring, to bring to your attention, to inform you as far as will this work or will this won't, give you pros and cons. You got no cons, you just got whatever they came up with for a pro. And that's wrong to say that this board just will just let it go as a that as just routine business. That's that's bad. We de we rely on you people to be our gatekeepers here to represent the town, whether it's something we want or don't want. But if you see something that's going on such as this, that's just again tomorrow night without any public comment, is wrong. And this is where we we're relying on you people to be our gatekeepers to watch out for our backs and to, to, to put this on hold and say, this isn't ready to go, that we need more than one potential public meeting between, between now and the time this is gonna to go to a vote to, to hear everything, our side, their side, all the sides. Then you can come up with a, a real realistic vote for this thing. Um, everybody here has, has the paperwork that's been sent in. Just so you folks know, from Mr. Smith's property to Mr. Burkmeyer's property, Oh, to the people on Appleton, Englewood, the Delisles, uh, Woodland, and Linton Lane. Anybody that's impacted has signed your paper. Mm -hmm. We haven't hit the people on Park Street yet because we just ran out of time. But if you drive down Park Street and you're looking at taking a large piece of their front yards, um, some of the things that you, the board might not know, is these rails trails have to be potentially 16 to 18 feet wide. And they talk about, you know, the town owned land next to Mr. Delion. They own 10 feet. Um, I asked the question, uh, how much of this is wetland and how much of this is private property looking to be taken? There's no answer to that. Well, when I, when I do the schematic and the scale on it, it's somewhere in the 70 to 75 percentile private to wetlands. Uh, conservation has not been notified whatsoever of any type of impact or what their feeling is. I deal a lot with the conservation here in town, and I know do not look at one of Leah's trees or plants or bushes in this town. I think that's something, once again, as our gatekeepers needs to be answered before war our warrant number 28 should be taken seriously. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Is there anyone else? And Mr. Gilberto, can you also just keep an eye on any um, attend virtual attendees too, in case there's anyone else that wants to? Yeah. Please, ma'am. Deborah Pascal, 170 Elm Street. This is basically a comment. A bike path may sound innocuous, not invasive. However, the reality under the 
2006 DOT shared path in green ways rules. Number one, bike paths, walking paths must be 10 to 14 feet wide with an additional two foot shoulders on either side to allow for stopping, resting off path, etc. at a minimum. Another one foot on either side must be kept clear of brush and trees. That shared use path is a road, an 18 foot road. Would you want that on your property? Do you want to sentence your neighbors to this invasion of their personal space and their right to their American dream? Thank you. Thank you. Offside? Come on. Yes, please. <coughs> Ma one, could you just hang on one minute? Sure. I think we're experiencing <laughs> technical, technical issues. <laughs> uh, are we disconnected, with Michael? Yes, we are. Somehow the audio dropped off. I'm not sure how, but we've got m multiple complaints online here. We'll fix that. Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by pound. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. Please. My name is Fred Hyde, and I own the property at 114 Hagel Street, North Reading. And my letter came in this morning um, with Mr. Burke by his group. Oh, okay. But I'm certainly going to watch that meeting tomorrow night. But while I have a voice tonight, I want to make sure that I'm on the record as saying that if this goes any further, I'm not going to grant any any easements on my property. They've come through and they've just drawn a line right through my property. And I own a small, small acre, just a third of an acre. And that's where I stand with this. And I'm going to be very brief to it, but that, I want to know what I say that. Thank you. My letter is in. Okay, right. thank you. Yes, it was one of the ones that was <coughs> attached <coughs> to Mr. Burke. Yes, yes. All right. Is anyone else that wants to speak? Is there anyone virtually that wants to speak, Mr. Gilberto? I'm looking to see if there are any raised hands. I'm not seeing any. There were some comments in the chat with regard to the audio cutting out, and we've fixed that. While the audio cut out, for anyone that's attending virtually, we had multiple speakers who were not interested in this project moving forward and going through their land. So that was a repeated message here. Yes. Um, and no uh, I don't know if that is, so that's not, no, no further? Okay, no further comment. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're go going to, I don't know if anyone <laughs> has any more comment on it. Uh, I was trying to Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. O'Leary. Did you did you have your hand raised? Yeah, I did. I just wanted to, to, to clarify it. And I don't disagree that we're the gatekeepers, but by the same token, we also have a responsibility to the other boards, committees, and commissions who do an awful lot of work and volunteer work. As I stated earlier, it only takes 10 signatures to put a citizen's petition on the warrant that we can't keep off. So why would we subject our boards, committees, and commissions? If something isn't popular, that's okay. Again, I'm not disagreeing with what's been uh, stated here in relation to uh, public outreach input and uh, the timing of, of all this. You know, should something have been done you know, well ahead of time in relation to vetting this better? Of course, it can always be better. You know, but money more than quarterbacks, great. Of course, it can be it can can be done better. Um, but again, I think, the, I think the, I think the, I think the, sir, sir, please, sir, no, 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 because, sir, because, not, no, 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 Mr. O'Leary, I just want to say, just please, I, through the chair, and let's not do a right. debate. No, I, I think it's, it's we, important for the public to understand, you know, that the 10 signatures are for, is what they call a citizen's petition. Mm -hmm. When you have local boards, committees, and commissions, they do their work, year in, year out, and then they want to put, put something forward for the public's consideration, town meetings' consideration. It's a small courtesy. Nine years. 
for us to extend to them to do that. And, and again, I have no problem doing it. But again, I don't necessarily, and would not necessarily endorse everything that's been proposed by every board committee and commission over the years. And anybody's been paying attention, I don't always support it. So, <coughs> but they, they have every right to be heard. And again, town meeting is the only venue that can be done. Town meeting does the appropriating, not this board. And town meeting has the ultimate decision. If they wish to bring it forward, I'm not going to impede that. And again, I may not support it, but. Okay. All right. Yes, Mrs. Gonzalez. Thank you, earlier. Mrs. Gonzalez. So, and, uh, excuse I, me, and I appreciate your concern, and, and I appreciate the, the constructive criticism of, that you're offering. And I, I may not endorse it. I, I, I'm going to state for the record again. I intend, if they ask us to put it on and leave it on there, to leave it on. That's up to them. But I think in the next two or three weeks, you're going to find out whether or not they're going to hold hard and fast or say, let's work on this a little further and bring it up later on. I'm not going to make that decision for them. All right. Mrs. Gonzalez. I just want to clarify that um, Mr. O'Leary is speaking for himself, not for the board. Right. That's me. Yeah, and I, I also would I'd add to that. This, this, isn't, this is probably even precedes the three of you when this first came up um, and came up in town town meeting vote approving expenditure for, for design and study. I do um, recall when it was first proposed, when we, fr the very first mapping we looked at, it was through quite a few, predominantly uh, private parcels. So that was something the board w said, no, no, go back to, no. And, and, that, and you saw this occur at the meeting where we were receiving an updated map and well, some of you that were here and we said, you know, no, no, you have to go back, you have to go back. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's probably not an easy task, but I, I also wasn't, I don't think we were clear in terms of where this pathway was or how many parcels it might, whether it was behind someone's parcel or through someone's parcel. I think a picture tells, you know, tells the story and we needed to see that and we really didn't have that clear. So probably some of us are going to be watching the virtual meeting tomorrow as well, but they do have to come back here again and give us whatever revised plan or update there is. And, and then like Mr. O'Leary is saying, is maybe, they're, maybe they don't want to pursue this until they've had more time to look at it and more time to meet with residents. But it's kind of resoundingly clear that the people who's, who are going to be basically directly impacted are opposed to it. And if, if it does go through to the warrant, which is typically the process, that show up and make a resounding no vote. And that is where this, that's where the town hears what's wanted for this. But I'm looking forward to seeing, I hope that they can redirect a path here. And I, that's what I'm looking forward to seeing. Mr. Leary, I, I hear what you said, and that's, I guess we'll just strongly disagree. I, I think that the political process here is we don't rubber stamp. If it's 10 votes, make them get it. Excuse me, this isn't a rubber stamp either. No. Um, the other thing, uh, Madam Chair, just, just to let you folks know, if you review any of the meeting minutes or even if you watch the meeting tomorrow night, um, when he originally said his presentation beginning he said the most important thing is to get from Linfield to Wilmington and then it goes into Tewksbury and Bill Ricker and that's going to continue the, the state money is only if the real trail is completed from one town to another midway through his presentation last time he said out loud he said well for right now we're going to concentrate on getting to Ipswich River Park that's the easy part of this trail for him from Ipswich River Park all the way over through the post office, across through the wetlands there, that's as difficult, if not more difficult, than what he's dealing with here. And I think that the board just needs to know that, because that was something that just kind of got another item that got swept underneath. There will be no monies after you spend the $850,000 that he's looking for to start this project for the 25%, if he's not successful going from point A in Linfield to B. The last thing that I'll say is, he, he, big part of his presentation was the, the rail trail that he opened that was opened in Peabody. That railroad train ran from up till 1981. This rail trail has been dead since 1920. Yeah. Big difference there. 
Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for the information. Mr. Mr. Walner? A few big record things. Um, the Land Utilization Committee is not asking. This, the town will never be amping up 10 or $12 million, as has been suggested. What, what the Land Utilization Committee is asking for is up to $850,000 for the first phase planning, and then after that, when all the discussions, negotiations have occurred, they'll be asking for another 850000 The state is on the dole. If, if you, you know, you're successful at the end of this, the state will be paying the $10 million plus to build this out and all the things that go along with it, two bridges, um, uh, sidewalks, where they're, wherever they're going to be needed. So the state is the one who's going to be paying for this. It's not, not the town. We do the planning. We put up the money to, to come up with a good path that's acceptable to the town. And then the state is going to fund all these these, uh, these this construction. So let's just be clear about that. The second thing is too is that I, I heard someone just say it was 70 percent private land. In fact, at the last meeting we showed you that it, most of it was green, which is public land, and yellow, which is public land through uh, 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 private ways. So the private impact, and I think tomorrow night you'll see an even greater improvement to that. But the private impact is actually quite small if we were to go by percentage. Two big points we need to know about. Okay. So I encourage you to watch tomorrow night and to uh, and learn, because as we've been getting feedback, we, we've had to work with MassDOT, because MassDOT has to kind of pre-approve our plans as we go forward. And so we're, we have, I believe we've come up with a successful uh, workaround plan that will uh, for most of you here, I don't think we're going to have an issue after tomorrow, but we'll see. Thank Do you want to just, just to Thank correct you. that? I said it was uh, up to 70% wetlands and or private. I didn't right. say strictly private. Strictly just, private. just so he knows, it's wetland impact as well as private impact. And on the wetlands well, impact, the reason why it's 10 to $12 million is because there are, I mean, the state's behind, obviously the state's not going to allow wetlands to be destroyed, but it's absolutely never going to happen. They're not going to let that happen. So a substantial amount of the construction is to find the least impactful way to do it and to do it through advanced <coughs> construction methods. Like really far extended uh, steel, uh, you know, steel uh, elevated trails with very little impact on the ground. At the end of the day, steel. Yeah. can we please it's stop with the back and forth? I'm sorry, yeah. please. It's going to be. Everything has to go through the chair, please. Sorry. It's, it's, we need to see more information with the LUC, and yeah. then they are going to come back here too. So we need to see more information from LUC as a select board to address these concerns that are, that are, have repeatedly been raised. And we've seen that in person and in writing now. So hopefully what they address, hopefully that goes a far measure towards addressing what we've heard from the residents' concerns here. I believe it will. Okay. All right. Mr. Studo. Well, I feel so left out. I'm the only one that is. I know. No, you don't, but that's okay. But I do have something to say. So um, without any judgment on the project, but I have different reasons why I think everyone in this room, you want to vote. Because what town meeting can do is either give a resounding yes, we want it, or a no. It will never be an opponent, someone who's against or for, being able to say, well, the select board didn't even give us the chance. Mm -hmm. Because for everyone in this room that doesn't think this is a great project, you want that affirmation at town meeting. I think it speaks volumes. It's not a, well, the only reason we don't have a bike trail is because a bunch of people went and yelled at the select board and they took it off the warrant. Because you will get that. You will definitely get that on Facebook because I know the year 2022. So in a way, I say that after we hear everything, like Mr. O'Leary said, we don't know if we're gonna recommend, not recommend. We don't know if the LQC may say, we're gonna live the fight another day, we don't think it's ready. But I do know that being in town, and I grew up in a city, so this is the first I, you know, taste I got of how the town is when, when I moved here five years ago. But I know that if you want legitimacy to your argument, you want to be able to point and say, hey, everybody had a chance to go to town meeting. 
We all voted. The town said no. You know, what are you going to do? Because I think that is what you want. You do not want, and this is for the pro or against. You also don't want the town, you know, somebody to say, oh, well, we knew this was going to go through and the select board just pulled it off because it will happen. So, again, I think for not only because people are putting in the work, but I would want this at town meeting one way or the other unless the sponsoring committee pulls it. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have one more comment on that, just, to, just one more for the public comment. I just needed to elaborate it's a little bit. It's the last more. comment because we do have other business we have to get to, and we have actually sure. heard from you already. Of course. No, and we I have your letter on record, too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I appreciate it, Mr. Stoda. So I think from our point of view, this is we, that's all we want. We want the town to be able to say, you know what, we heard the residents who would impacts. We understand your argument. We could put ourselves in their shoes. And we, if this was going through our area or our neighborhood, we would vote no as well. We still have not heard. Mr. Walner, maybe you can address this directly. But no. I mean, he was, went on Facebook and he posted to what not, do you see 70 people, 40 people in this room? There's like 20 something views on YouTube. Very little people are seeing these conversations we're having, but when they see one of our selectmen go on the public town Facebook page and post that all the landowners who are impacted are for this, and the majority of people we've spoken with are for this, how can we have any type of honest vote? How can we have any type of honest debate at the town meeting when a lot of this is already done? You told me yourself to come to the town meeting in an email, get, stop listening to misinformation on Facebook, get it directly from us. How does that, doesn't that put us at a disadvantage? Mr. Donahue, um, I'll just, in a, in, a, in a general sense, we haven't even actually voted recommendations on these warrant sure. articles. And that's how, when, we, when I say we shepherd this through the process, we hear you. And we each, five of us, get to vote yes or no, whether we're in favor of that or whether we're not. And if we're divided, board, three to two, four to one, at the town meeting, we stand up and explain why we're divided on that vote. Sure. Two might be absolutely opposed to it. Three might be absolutely in favor of it, mm -hmm. regardless of what we hear from the public. Right. This is a representation of people that are obviously directly impacted from everything that you've presented. But this is a small, small group of the larger group of registered voters in the town that are going to be voting. So that's what rules, and that's why what Mr. Studo and Mr. O'Leary are saying, we don't just say, okay, no, that's not gonna go on, this is gonna go on, and that's not gonna go on. You, that is not the process here. Mm -hmm. We don't get to pick and choose when someone comes forward as a citizen petition or another board comes forward and says, we wanna work on this. And this particular thing is not a new thing. It sounds like there was not a lot of dialogue from what everyone is saying. There was not a lot of dialogue with the parcels that are directly affected here. And that is a problem. You recognize the board has a problem with that and that we've asked LUC to go back and make sure that they do these things. And what we understand this evening is they're doing what we've asked them to do so that there's a lot more dialogue on this issue. And like Mr. Suda and Mr. O'Leary said, Go to the town meeting and make sure it gets voted down, and then we're ending the story there. I think we're ending the story there, unless they propose something different. Unless they propose part of it, not all of it. Uh, unless they, we'll, we have to wait and hear that. But we're not, we don't, we don't typically pick and choose. We shepherd it through to, to a vote on what goes on the warrant, and then we as a board vote individually on each and every warrant article what our recommendation is. Finance committee does the same. The ones that impact school committee, they do the same. The ones that in impact planning, they do the same. But that doesn't even matter. That's just a recommendation. That it's something we might have, have heard and entertained and reviewed and talked about for hours and hours, but that's just a recommendation. It's the vote that matters. Sure. Like Mr. Studo says, that's what matters. That's what carries the day. So it's really important for people to go and vote. But that's where transparency comes in. If you don't have the facts to work off of, how can you come to a conclusion? Yes, and, and, at the, and at that point, that's when people stand up with the facts. 
and explain the facts. And everybody gets an off, everybody that has that tag on gets the opportunity to speak. And so do we at that point, because we're voters, we're voters of what we feel about it, whether we should, we think it's good for the town or not. So someone posting on Facebook, that is not, unless they're saying, by the way, there's an LUC meeting, go to the meeting, and they're giving you information on scheduling. They're not speaking for the board. We speak for ourselves in this meeting. And we haven't even spoken yet on this article because we, we haven't taken a vote on it. We don't even have enough information. So that's really important for you to know that too. We're waiting too. And we want to see some, some dialogue with the residents and we want to see some change in this plan and see if it's feasible. All right, so we do have to move on because we have a, a bunch of other business, but we thank you for at least giving us your input on this. It's important to us to hear it. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. We have legal bills next. You guys don't want to stick around? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to stick around. <laughs> 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 Stay for the trash conversation. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are getting so educated. <laughs> yes, That's yes. That's a good one. Yeah. Mr. Astudo, legal bills. Next order of business. Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for February 2022 in the amount of $26,096.71 as follows. Oh my word. General 66.62.71, Labor 11.562, 20L 78.72 for a total of $26,096.71. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Can we turn that light on? Thank you. Thank you. So, any other? No, we have minutes. I don't want to keep anybody in the dark. <laughs> yes. Last call. Transparent. Nine, nine, uh, <laughs> one o'clock. One o'clock ahead of you. By the way, that's, <laughs> no, no, we have to talk. We have to help them to get that yes, up. We have to help them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, don't we have I'll, to stick I'll to our the minutes? We're going to have to post for a meeting, business. though. Can I fire through the minutes? Please do. Okay. Madam Chair, I move to approve the February 28, 2022 regular session minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Madam Chair, I move to approve the February 28, 2022 executive session meeting minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the March 14, 2022 regular session minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Madam Chair, I move to approve the March 14, 2022 executive session minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Madam Chair, I move to approve the March 21st, 2022 strategic planning minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That's it. Good. Town Administrator's report. Madam Chair, thank you. I included in my report a copy of a listing of projects that I provided to Senator Tarr and Representative Jones for, cons for their consideration as they look at potential state legislative funding sources. Um, it's a combination school and municipal list that I developed with um, working off of the listing of projects submitted to the Capital Improvement Planning Committee and um, items identified within both the municipal and school operating budgets as uh, new programs. Related to that, I was contacted by Congressman uh, Seth Moulton's office regarding uh, potential projects that might be eligible for uh, so-called uh, congressionally directed uh, funding, uh, which is, I guess, the new term for earmarks uh, of uh, congressional funding. And, um, you know, I went through the whole list with uh, the staff in his office. It took a, a, about an hour or so and then multiple emails afterwards to go through it with me. And we narrowed down uh, two projects that I submitted on behalf of uh, municipal government, uh, one being $1.5 million for the, uh, it would be roughly half, of the final wastewater design cost uh, that we would be seeking at the uh, special town meeting in the fall for the main park concrete north and lowell road project and the second component uh, another wastewater related project this would actually be for construction uh, of the interconnection of the municipal buildings in the center of town to the existing wastewater treatment plant um, their office very well aware of the priority that we're placing on the wastewater project um, want to be helpful 
are not going to be able to identify $113 million to do the project, but uh, when we started talking through, you know, biting off the right dollar amount, um, they, they felt that about $1.5 million was the right number for this particular bucket of funding that's out there. And so that's why those two projects were submitted. And um, I'm hopeful that we'll advance to the next round within the office and I'll answer any questions that they have with regard to those projects. The final thing I'll just note is I attached a copy of comments that the town planner submitted to the Department of Housing and Community Development with regard to the so-called MBTA Communities Program. I'll also note that I believe you also have in correspondence a copy of a letter that Representative Jones also submitted um, on behalf of the impacted um, communities uh, that he represents um, as well um, with regard to the, uh, the, the uh, project. And um, that concludes my report, Madam Chair. <coughs> Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Gilberto? All set? Let's talk about some board member reports and some old and new business. Mr. O'Leary, kick it off. Well, my us. board member reports were wastewater and Hillview, so <laughs> I think we've covered those pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I have no other things other than under old and new business. Um, I, I think we need to make some sort of a comment in relation to activities by a small group of residents who are uh, calling into question a few things in relation to how we've handled the pandemic, how they've called into question how the school committee has handled the, the situation, how the town administration has handled the situation and has uh, threatened suit of uh, uh, public officials both uh, appointed and elected including ourselves and that uh, you know they put us on notice and I think it's important for us to uh, articulate and let the public know that this is occurring and that um, our response to it is first of all we uh, don't believe that there's any merit to what they're, they're uh, contending at this particular point in time and uh, they are uh, causing um, a significant amount of uh, resources to be expended uh, both human resources here within town hall and uh, potentially uh, taxpayers uh, resources uh, from a legal standpoint to uh, defend uh, the positions that we've taken over the last two and a half years. Uh, I think what they're doing is uh, somewhat disillusioned and not well focused and I think it's uh, incumbent upon us to uh, state publicly that we believe that uh, the administration, <coughs> town administration, school administration, uh, local boards and committees uh, have responded well uh, in the public interest and in the public health interest uh, of the community during this pandemic. And uh, I think it's a shame that they're, they're taking this route. But that being said, you know, I think we need to send a message to our employees in the school department that we support what they've done. Uh, we support everything that they've done over the last two and a half years and appreciate it. And that uh, we will defend the actions that they've taken if necessary. And that since they have decided to threaten the suit, uh, they should be cautioned uh, into how they respond or if they respond at all. And I don't think the administration should expend much in the way of resources right now. And if we go are going to, it should be through council. So uh, I want to say publicly that I've had some people reach out to me uh, asking for uh, me to intercede on their behalf in relation to some of these actions. I have not responded. Again, I've been elected public official for 49 years here. And I'm take pride in um, answering constituents' calls, but if they threaten lawsuits, you know, they threaten uh, other town employees, other elected officials, and appointed officials uh, with lawsuits, I am not gonna respond in writing. I am not gonna respond anywhere but in public. And so if they're more than welcome to come here and question me, I'd be happy to respond in public. But at this particular point in time, I will just refer them to the administration to go through council. Okay. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Waller? No, just, uh, uh, we have that thing on April 13th, right? Um, Wednesday, tomorrow night? Uh, Wednesday night, sorry. Uh, yeah. For the NORCAM at the Discovery. I'm flying out of state, so I'm You're not gonna be there? Be there. Okay, oh, all right. <coughs> um, so the uh, uh, NORCAM is doing on Wednesday night, uh, starts at seven o'clock, and it will be broadcast only. Phil could probably tell us better than that. Yeah, anybody. exactly, uh, that's the transcripts. Oh, we're just covering it. Oh, okay. So, and transcript is, is leading the debate, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I'll speak for two minutes and then it's basically on the school committee. I think Maureen Doherty asked for questions.
questions in advance. I don't know if that time frame closed. It's, it's already closed, yeah. Okay, it's so yeah. people were able to submit the questions in advance so the candidates will be questioned virtually to answer those questions. Yeah, so. and it, it, with an interesting wrinkle there, they've asked the 18-year-olds um, at, the, at the high school to not only vote, but to also ask questions, which I find to be a very interesting way to approach this to the school committee. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what, what we hear from the 18 notes. So I encourage everybody to listen. Right. Yeah. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Mr. Studo. Um, so we met at EDC last week, and um, I can tell you there's, well, from that group, there's tremendous backing for SOAR and what it could bring. Um, I think they, uh, again, reiterated that, you know, many members there that have been around a lot longer than me, that they've seen a ceiling hit to the town, right, not having that for, from a commercial base standpoint, and that pretty much, you know, it's something where we're going to have, remember how last year we had, the annual, we had an event? We're going to have two. Um, we're going to have one that is before... Uh, uh, I, I forgot the date. We have the date. It's in May. I'll, I'll have it next time. I'm sorry. But one's going to be before June town meeting in the event that there is something to talk about if we have a warrant article regarding SOAR for the betterment. But then another that comes in October before the special town meeting where it's something where another two opportunities to talk about it in a less formal setting than maybe a meeting like we're, even though we're going to have like a hundred public hearings about this, just another setting. And I feel like there especially, you're probably going to get most of the people that may be subject to this betterment, right, because of what it is. So, so that's something uh, that uh, we're working on to put together that event. Um, and luckily enough, we have budget, so I don't have to come here and ask for more money because we have it already, which is nice. So, um, and and other than that, um, that's it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Strudel. Mrs. Gonzalez. So you heard from Trash tonight, so I don't have <laughs> to go over that. <laughs> um, so I, I'm just going to follow up on what I talked about in the last meeting with the community impact team that has so much going on, so much excellent stuff going on. Um, they're guiding good choices, which is held at the library from 6 to 8.30. There were four dates, so they've already done two. But April 13th, setting your family up for success, and April 27th, youth substance use and mental health 101. Um, also, the hidden in plain sight, um, Monday, May 2nd through Friday, May 6th, um, which is free. It goes in half hour intervals at the North Reading Police Department Community Room. Um, can you spot things in plain sight that your kids could be hiding from you? Um, it's a great thing to do. Uh, it's very eye-opening. And then the Strong Families, Resilient Kids, 40 Assets to Build Up Strong Kids. Um, One-hour sessions that run from April 11th through May 11th, and you can find that all this information on their website, the Community Impact Team, Facebook page. Um, just a lot of things going on, a lot of excellent things going on. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to say I participated years ago when my boys were in high school. Yeah. That, uh, in play. Oh, yeah. It is amazing how resourceful these uh, young people can be. They're hiding things right under your nose. But it's, <laughs> yes. Uh, but it's a, it's a great program. Um, and again, it's not just for, for parents, it's for grandparents. You know, with our aunts and uncles, they really should, uh, if you have the opportunity to participate, it, it's eye-opening, it really is. It really is. It, it's, a great, it's a great thing, and everybody should do it, really. Um, I had one more thing. Thank you. Oh, please. The Sing Fling, unless you're going to oh, talk about yes, it. yes, the Sing Fling, Thursday. All right, if you want to talk about it, I'll give it to you. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I think that we should publicize that because mm -hmm. it's also a fundraiser for Notorious for their trip into New York. And it's going to be Thursday night, right? Tickets are on. I think you buy the tickets online. Four at the door. 
Or at the door. Oh, or at the door. Okay, and they're $10 a ticket. $10 yes. online, 15 at the door. And yeah. how can you go wrong with an evening of uh, a cappella, right? 7 p.m. And yes. where is this again? At the Performing Arts Center at the okay. high school. And it's Thursday night? Yes, okay. yes. We had an uh, uh, amazing, fantastic, uh, they hosted the All Town Band and All Town Chorus last week. And it's incredible to see how the programs have just, there's so many, so many students that participate. It's just unbelievable to see how many, how big this has grown over the years. And it's really a credit to the music programs at all the, all the elementary schools, at the middle school and at the high school, that they're just keeping these students interested. And one of the things that Carla Lista mentioned as she was emceeing the programs was that, and I didn't, I didn't actually know this, I don't know if my colleagues knew it, they, um, they basically fought to keep our music program going yeah. during COVID. The administration, so you're tying into Mr. Yeah. O'Leary's remarks that, you know, the administration, Dr. Daly, the, we should be, we should be commending, commending Dr. Daly for his efforts, not condemning him. And he kept that going, and it's, it's so, it was, the, the, to keep the music programs going when other municipalities saw theirs gone, and they did all kinds of things. They went outside to rehearse, they got, you know, covers for their instruments, chorus rehearsed on one, one lawn, and the, you know, band rehearsed on the other lawn, and the chorus chased after the band music, etc. when the wind blew it away, and so, but they, they pivoted, just like Dr. Daly and the administration did. They pivoted. These are people, I just don't think people realize all the effort that went into pivoting during COVID for people like Dr. Daly, like our town administrator, like our town employees who are actually going through it with their own young families, but also trying to pivot to make the services of the town continue keep town employees safe and make education continue and certainly the music program continue. It's easy now to, you know, to criticize and condemn and, and you, know, you know, call for all kinds of directives and edicts and mandates and things like that. But I think, I, I think that we as a board should stand behind what our school did, what our Board of Health has done, what our administration has done, what our superintendent has done, what our town administrator has done. And I've said it before when we've had our own discussions. There, there was no textbook for this. And we can look back and we can make improvements on things that were done and we can, we can make corrections on things that were done. But let's not condemn someone um, for trying to work in a crisis mode. He took over in January and COVID hit in March. And he should be commended for every effort that he took working around the clock to make sure that, that everything was remained in place. And I think music program is just one example of that. This is something that these kids needed for their mental well-being. Absolutely. In addition to all the other stuff that a music curriculum adds to a student's life. So. Um, in education. So I appreciate that you s stated that, Mr. O'Leary, at the outset. And I, I, I think as a board, I think that's not just you speaking personally. No, no, sure I not. hope that that is our board's shared opinion of things in regard to what, what's being done. And I think we need to say that publicly so that when people are watching what's going on publicly, they know that our board is behind the administration and behind our administrators, not just on the town side, but on the school side. Mrs. Gonzalez, she has her, her she's my finger. <laughs> she wants I, to add to this. I do want to add to that. Um, something that we learned during a meeting um, that we were in with um, Patrick, um, the superintendent, that we weren't aware of you know, it's one thing to question, and I don't have a problem with parents questioning and, and wanting more information, but this is so far beyond that. 
he is he is just endowed with having to come up with all kinds of records and he can't even do anything else. He can't do his daily work because he's being inundated, inundated with all of this um, paperwork that he has to give because of what's being done to them, to them right now. So um, that just struck me as, you know, I don't think the public, I don't think people understand what's being done, that they're being taken away from their actual work that they need to get done. Um, because they have no time to do that because they have to get all this paperwork um, that they're being, what is the, I don't know, yes. the technical uh, words, the we're, we're, we, we're only yeah. the recipients of some of what's been going on, but he's been targeted for multiple yeah. public records requests. That's that are absorbing in a remarkable amount, and not just of his time, but of the town administrator's time. It's absorbing yes. town resources yes. to answer these types. And they're, they're you know, public information, public record, but asking for 3,000 emails or get all of the communications from X period to X period that requires review, not just by one person, but by multiple people in case, especially with school records, in case there's exempt material, material that's protected that can't be turned over. And I don't think that, you know, we as a board realize all of the other things that are, you know, he's dealing with, um, which includes that. Just so there's, there's not only the targeting of the, of the letters and the targeting of officials to go ahead and fire him or I'm gonna, I'm gonna sue you unless you fire him, but there's also a targeted effort on multiple public records requests. I hope they're being charged for it because the law provides, well, the Freedom of Information Act is, is there for everybody to take advantage of. There are also costs associated with it. And again, if it has to go to legal counsel to be reviewed, it's going to cost the town money. It should cost the right. requesting individuals uh, time also. So I hope that that's being processed and uh, see if the gentleman and his small group of 10 people there want to, uh, to pay the bill. You know, see how really important it is to them. I mean, it's one thing to be disruptive. You know, it's another thing to have to pay for that disruption. How important is it really? You know, where's their principle come come into play? And you know, is it that important to them if they're willing to cough up thousands of dollars, which is what it's costing the community uh, to produce this? Uh, so I, I would hope that uh, well, the information needs to be provided. There is also a cost for the requests that are being made. I hope they're being assessed that. It, and, and I'll just I'll just leave it at this. It, it is unfortunate that as we kind of we learn to live with COVID and we move out of all of those kind of emergency measures that were in place, and hopefully improve. And the, you know, with with the, with all the things that we're able to do to address it, moving out of that. It's unfortunate that there's this polarizing conduct that we couldn't just talk, sit down and talk and, you know, invite some, you know, some effort of, you know, I thought that this could be handled. It's not like that at all. And it, 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 it's unfortunate that that's the approach that's being taken. The, you know, the messaging that's being taken is, is just, Unfortunate. I don't think it's representative of how most of the citizens of the town feel. I think it's a small group. So, like Mr. O'Leary says, we can, I guess, leave it to the lawyers, and that's at the cost of the taxpayers. That's at our. Uh, that's at the taxpayers' expense. That it has to be addressed through lawyers because of the threat of litigation. So we're going to leave it at that. And this is one time where our official status. Unfortunately, our personal relationships, our official status, because we've been served with a notice of intent to sue, our official status requires us to allow the response and the communication through counsel. So that will be what it will be. But we do stand by Dr. Daly, and, and, the, and we want the school administration and our town administration to know that how much we appreciate the efforts that have been made to carry us through, to keep operations going, to keep schooling going, our town employees, all the effort that was put in around the clock to, to making things run 
while people were also had their own families to take care of. Well, you know, they weren't in a cocoon, they were helping, working for us. So uh, we do really appreciate that. I think it was a remarkable effort, and I, in the back of my head, I wonder how many lives were saved by the efforts that people made. And I think there was probably a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't ever measure that, but I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, from the COVID end, a lot of people are alive today because of the efforts that were made. Not a perfect world, but I think unprecedented times, you're never going to get it absolutely right. But I think overall, the coordination, the efforts, feedback I got from anybody I've ever heard from the schools has always been very positive, been very um, uh, uh, complimentary of how the schools have handled themselves. And uh, you know, it's unfortunate that we have a handful that are uh, going the other way. <laughs> but it's not representative, I think, of the community at all. Okay. All right. And with that, adjourn. Madam Chair, I move to adjourn. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Motion by Mr. Stewart, second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous.